Hello and welcome to the Scanlon Podcast, your weekly look at the world of film news, Irish International. I'm Darren and joining me are... Jay. Grace. So we're going to talk about what we normally talk about this podcast. We're going to talk about the top ten, the new releases, the week in film news, but we're going to start with what we normally do. So Grace, what have you watched since last we talked? What have I watched? Let me just pull up my wee list here. Um, oh yeah, I watched one spectacularly terrible film, so we'll have something fun to talk about. Fantastic. Ooh. But um, the first one I want to mention is Unicorn Store. Which is Brie Larson's wonderful directorial directorial debut. Yeah, we talked about this last week, actually. Yeah, I came mm-hmm. up because myself and Luke had seen it. And Darren had seen it, obviously. But yeah, we, and think... we talked about it the week before as well, which is good. Right. Mm. Well, um, I loved this. I actually loved it a lot more than I was expecting because it was one of those films that once it started, it was, you know, the quirk is almost slightly off-putting at times. And you're yeah. like, this is a very sort of alienating world because it just feels very childlike and, and, you know, a little bit overwhelming. But then as it went on, I really grew into it. And I think... What really anchored it for me was Bree's performance. I think she just brought so much humanity to that character who could seem like a caricature in many ways. But the way that that intertwined with how the story was presented, the use of colour and the way she had all of her little spaces kind of outfitted with imagery and and, um, glitter and all of these really just girlish, feminine things. I just thought it was such a lovely evocation of that inner self that I think a lot of us have and probably still cling to even when we're adults and that kind of um feeling of what it is to be innocent and to believe like anything is possible and you know you're a little bit special and a little bit distinctive and there's something different about you and then when you go out into the real world as it were um it all is kind of just peeled away from you much faster than I think a lot of us would like to admit and that can be a really difficult adjustment and I get the impression that this is something that people tend to uh, run down the I'm not even going to say millennials because millennials covers an age bracket up to like the age of what 39 or something these age, days yeah, yeah so, 39 how many four years out like, yeah no because it, it starts with the but early age with the kids I'm Gen X man well it yeah. is millennials came of age during the, at the millennium isn't it as, yep. as opposed to like being born at uh, ah, yeah. most people so you're talking about like by. early 80s down to early not or mid 90s maybe you bust them but yeah younger people i think some people can be really some people older people boomers whatever can be really hard on on the younger generation and make boomers it like they're really bastards. weak and stupid and can't really do anything and like i have to say there's something that i feel all of us should be able to recognize especially if we came of age in the 90s or shortly thereafter when as we've discussed previously i believe everything was mostly fine and it seemed like things were gradually getting better and then everything just stopped and went into reverse and went to hell and that's a lot to deal with yeah because you're literally seeing all of these dreams and aspirations and expectations that you have go up and smoke before your eyes. So I think this film is just a really nice, childlike, irreverent take on that because it's just it just feels really personal and intimate and like there's something in that character that everyone can identify with. And especially that scene near the end, which I won't spoil, but, you know, kind of the momentous scene. Yes. Um, it just it was so heartfelt and just really tenderly drawn. And I just I just love the film as kind of that portrayal of what it is to have that inner self that you're afraid to lose and which has sustained you and nurtured you through a lot but you need to sort of break away from to evolve or to grow up and it was just I wasn't expecting it to feel yeah. that there is a sense of loss for me. Um, yeah. of that and I think you touched on it exactly that in terms of how the world has gone and how the world is and how we approach it like if you're of an age and I'm of an age and the age is the age and whatever but I'd be in my 40s and I, I would be a Generation X kind of thing. I would have grown up in the last kind of probably hurrah of people that might be this expected. This can't see, but Jay is wearing a Nirvana t-shirt. He brought his <laughs> I am not. How dare him. you? Um, I was a Pearl Jam man. But anyway. Um, the baseball cap is on backwards though. Yeah, and I'm sitting on the chair backwards because I can rap with the That's kids. That's how he reaches But uh, I would have, the last probably generation that would reasonably be able to consider the fact that you might be able to own your own home in this country and these things matter in the context of I think what the film's trying to say even though it's if it's not explicit in that way it's like what do you do in the world when all you can hope for is shitty work contracts and casual uh, sexual harassment yeah and, and things that just grind you down and how mm-hmm. do you how do you appropriate yourself how do you what do you do with the world when the world is not brilliant what do you, oh, yeah. when the world doesn't come back to you what do you put out there what what, yeah. what are you contributing what do you, how do you feel that you're alive or whatever and I think I think I said last week and I, I'm, I'm going to keep raking over it, I guess because we, we talked about it before but I, I did say last week that I felt it was a very risky project to do as a filmmaker because I think there's 
to do something this sincere and this honest is extremely tricky. I think the balance act is extremely tricky. I think it gets it right for the most part a couple of moments, as Grace alluded to, where the quirk kind of almost tries to overwhelm, but I think she gets away with it. Larson for pretty much most of the running time. And I think that's clever filmmaking. For a first time filmmaker, I think that's really impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I think time will be kind to this film, I think. Um, yeah. I think a few years from now, I think it'd be an interesting one, depending on how the world goes, obviously, in the next few years, assuming it's still here. But uh, Broadcasting from the apocalypse. But I do think it'd be interesting to see how people view this film five or ten, perhaps ten years from now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talked about last week, and again, no need to rake over the cults. I agree with you, well, first of all, I agree with both of you to a a certain extent. Um, I agree with you entirely that it's a very brave film to make. Uh, and I think it's a very personal film, and I think it's very important. It shows a lot of promise, a lot of potential, and stuff like that. I may be a bit more cynical about the quirk than you are, but I do admire it and think it's, it's yeah. very laudable in that in those terms. I agree entirely with Grace actually when she's talking about this idea of the millennial thing, and particularly how it reflects a broader movement in culture as well. Because you look at this, but you also and again, this was what screened at uh, Sundance in 2017. Sounds about so right. So it's been sitting uh, in the Netflix world for about two years, waiting for the release of Captain Marvel. Yeah. But the you look at contemporary films like say Little, for example, which was out last week, or Cap- or even Shazam. And you have this idea of like childhood and the idea that like old movies used to dream about kids becoming adults, waking up in the body of an adult. Yeah, you yeah. have Freaky Friday where a kid mm-hmm. swaps a body with a Big. parent, for example. Big is the, 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 the other The great example. touchstone for it. Like, yeah, that sort of stuff. Like you have that entire subgenre, De Grande, the Italian film as well from the same time. Whereas, because that was the idea, it was like kids should dream of being adults. Uh, they should dream of being. Look at the world and the opportunities there are yeah, out there. Yeah. Yeah. Being an adult is great because you yeah. get to stay up late, you get to earn money, you have complete freedom. Eat whatever you like. And and. Yes. What's interesting about modern culture is that, I mean, you, you could tie it into all the other stuff that's happening with the Judd jo- jo- Apatow uh, comedies. I got it not, but yes, you can. Uh, you, like, uh, <laughs> yes. you have this idea yeah. now that, like, and I think Grace was entirely right when she said that, like, for millennials for a certain generation, you're right, you won't own a house, but you also won't have a stable career. The average person coming of age now will be expected to work three careers in their lifetime, as opposed to having a steady job that will keep them going until mm-hmm. retirement, yeah. which naturally means losing out on opportunities for other things and things that you want to do as well. They're less likely to get married, they're less likely to be in relationships, they're less likely to have the standard metrics that people apply for successful adulthood yep. and mm-hmm. so when you have that going on you have this question of like if you can't be the adult that society expects you to be and it's in this movie as well very explicitly in kids relationship with her parents where yes. she can't be the adult that her parents expect mm-hmm. her to be and she tries to be but it's just suffering and suffocating and stuff like that the question is then what other option do you have but to retreat to childhood or to retreat back to that sense of wonder and possibility and endless childhood and i think this is just it's kind of interesting to see that bubbling through pop culture yes here metaphorically literally in shazam which is about a superhero in his off hours as a kid yes. little which is about a successful businesswoman a tech entrepreneur who basically gets to go back to childhood and to recapture all of her lost opportunities because being a child is awesome. And it's kind of interesting to see all those no, things it, bubbling through. Mm-hmm. I think it's a positive regression, I think, is probably yeah. the best way because it's regression yeah. in and of itself is unfair. I don't, And I think that's what's generally leveled at. And we'll use millennials as a shorthand, but we think we know we're done with it. Yeah. Um, that, you know, they don't want any part of the world, but they want part of the world that well, they, they that they're, they're not yeah, there's an argument like, to be made that like the world that's, that's being gone. given to them is not it's the world, a world that, that you would want. The world that generations were wrecked. Yeah. Like, and, and that's what you're being offered. Yeah. yeah. And there's a word that's really interesting. And it, again, we'll like probably, they, they earn like, less than their parents. They're one of the first generation since World War Two to mm-hmm. earn less than their yes. parents, which is remarkable. Yeah. But um, I think it, I think Larson, and I think this is really interesting. And I won't kind of be too explicit here because it kind of gives away a certain thing. But like the parents in the film are essentially boomers by my reading of it. Mm-hmm. Like, well, it makes Larson, sense. Yeah, like, the, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, like, Larson, it's the casting yeah, yeah. of uh, right. John Cusack and, and Bradley Whitford. Bradley Whitford, right. And there's an interesting thing like, they do around... Um, the West Wing. Like, yes, yes. Whitford will always be the yeah, yeah, embodiment sure. of the West Wing. Also, he looks like... Uh, what's the writer? The, the, the Raven? Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah, he looks exactly like Edgar Allan Poe. But Google that if you want. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but anyway. Uh, the, how they were casting... That's, that's the same not movie. an unreasonable comparison to make, actually. No. What's, what's the guy who played him in the John... Oh, John Cusack. John Cusack yes. like played John him Cusack. in the Raven. There's, there was a missed opportunity. John Cusack could play anyone. Like my aunt's uh, Star is Born, which she was interested in until she discovered it didn't star the sexy Bradley. She was waiting for Bradley Whitford's A Star is Born. Oh, okay. That's an alt history uh, uh, come to on, consider, tell me isn't it? Anyway, I can't imagine. I can Anyway, yes. There's a scene that... There's a campfire scene um, that... That really, I think it really speaks to a lot of themes in the film uh, around uh, Brie Larson kind of, our parents are kind of these, bring these kids out to kind of rafting and camping and stuff. And it's this kind of campfire scene where they kind of tell about their upbringing and their lives and stuff. And it's kind of, Brie Larson has a, car, a conversation with one of the young kind of people that are at it about it. And they're kind of throws rise up to heaven and being kind of a bit mm-hmm. aware as young people are about these kind of things. But then she has a conversation with her parents, which kind of, to some degree, upends 
what has and didn't has or not happened. And I found that really fascinating because there's two things going on there. One is their parents' realisation of things that's going on around young people. And some people do know, some people are aware, um, older people like me, that are aware of the world and it's not just, a, and yeah. it's, it's not just and shouldn't be self-centred. And like, I haven't made enough, so I'm going to hold everything I have because it should be more than that. And I think she <coughs> gets at that very obliquely. I don't, like, it's, she doesn't take these things on head on. And I think that's, it's the, I think that's really yeah. extreme, extremely clever. I think there's a lot in the smaller details here that are yes. really nice and too. Like the way, even when she's going into her temp job and she's wearing these this ridiculous oversized outfit that literally makes her look like a child wearing her mother's clothes. And then the fact that, you know, she's kind of second guessing herself and wondering, is her boss harassing her? And she doesn't even that feel like she has enough life experience like, to tell. Like it's just... It's just, for me, one of those perfect evocations of those moments where you've been sort of trained to doubt everything and you don't really know what's going on and you wonder, is this how it's supposed to be because I don't really know any better? And even then there's a whole part where her parents say to her, like, you should just do kind of, you know, what everyone else is doing. Like, you're good at that. Kind of just, <laughs> I you know, love like a little, else does. <laughs> a little sort of, you know, veil dig there. Where it's just like, oh, you don't have to be like all special and unique. Just be like normal just or be a drone something. Like the rest of them. Just, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And, that, and I guess moments like that, what you said and what I was going to get at, mm-hmm. is why I think, again, as I mentioned earlier, why I think five or ten years down the line, I think it'd be an interesting film to revisit in yeah. the context of how the world is and how the world was in that regard. And I think it might, I might well have grown in stature in that sense. You'd like to think so, anyway. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it needs to grow in stature. No, but it's I just... No, no. Like it's... No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that... Then it will age Debut well. films are... Yeah, exactly. And debut films can be like tricky. something and unique from yeah. its time period. Yeah, I think... So yeah, speak. I don't think it'll timestamp in the way. I think it'll grow... I mm-hmm. think the things she's getting at will grow more... I mean, it's aware. Again, again, we're noting, like, again, this was a 2017 film, which mm-hmm. is already in the two years age, remarkably well. We're talking about it very much in the context of 2019, yeah. so I think that's already borne out. Yeah. Can you imagine it's only been two years and the world has already changed so much? Good Lord. Just why? I mean, um, more cake, that's right. Well, we were talking about the, the news that we're going to cover on this podcast, and Jay was like, what's that this week? <laughs> yeah. It was Spoiler a decade ago. It was. But anyway, yeah. sorry. I've had, I spent a year one week. <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah. Um, then... After that, I went to see Us, finally, to catch up with it. Um, it's in the top ten. Think... It is not in the top ah, ten. Ah, it's so not about it, Grace. Um, I found this disappointing, to say the least. It was, it's a very strange film. Not entirely sure what it thought it was going for. It's kind of burdened with very heavy exposition, both at the beginning and at the end. A twist that seems abundantly obvious from the moment it happens. And then... Just there's such a strange mishmash of tone here or something where there's a comedic thing running through it, which in and of itself is fine. Um, but then you also have moments where it's like suddenly quite violent and sort of a slasher movie and then it's doing something else entirely. And then it sort of airs into black comedy territory. And then it's like, is this trying to be more of a satire? And it just it doesn't knit itself together well at all for me. And I just found that very disappointing because I like I think I can see what they were going for in some ways but I just don't think it realised anything of note and it's also too long one of those films that just felt like it kept going and kept going and even after what was going to happen became very clear it continued to keep going (coughs) and um, yeah no it just wasn't a fan of this I don't think it's outright terrible but it's certainly not worth very much yeah I I don't I don't think it's outright terrible either I think there's some interesting things in there but I, I, I yeah. we talked about before, but I, I sat beside Darren when we watched it, and <laughs> that would have been interesting it was an to experience. see. I, I, there was, I was so up. many whispered, would you stop? <laughs> there was a bit of that, and I, I, at, at a certain point in the film, I start laughing, and it's like, come on, like, just come on, like, there's nobody else getting away with this nonsense, like, and I don't know, it. I like Peel, and I'll be back, and I'll be mm-hmm. watching the next one he makes, and I'll be watching the. Um, Twilight Zone uh, reboot. When it eventually becomes when available. It, well, when I want to watch it. Is what That's it is. fair as well. Yeah. Uh, but I, I will get to it. I, I, I like him a lot and Get Out it's brilliant. Mm-hmm. So, like, I'm, you get a pass not everybody can make great films all the time. Yeah. And that's such is life. Yeah. I'm going to stick right. my hand up as the requisite us defender. On the yes, you are, and that's absolutely fine. Decent chance of making my top ten at the end of the year. I suspect that won't be the case. Well, we'll see. That's <laughs> my guess. It's been a very rough middle of the year. Yeah, it started out rather promising. This is not the middle of the year. It's April. It's April. Yeah, it's we're not middle that. of we're the year. We're third of the right. way through. We're suddenly in the middle yeah. third at this point. We're this 1. The... 1.5 quarters in. Yeah. Middle of the year is June. Yeah, but it's a stretch. 
Anyway, this You're point is a stretch, Jane. Darren. All right. Anyway, so I take the point. Um, then I watched a film on Netflix called The Silence, which is a thinly veiled ripoff <laughs> of <laughs> A Quiet Place, written and before it apparently. Written before I might point it. That, I might point out just for decency. Absolutely atrocious. I heard his pants. Like absolutely abs- pants. Yeah. Like you know how you watch films sometimes that are really bad, but they're kind of enjoyable yes. in their own way because oh, you're like, ah, this those. is a bit daft. But I saw someone on Letterbox say this is like Birdemic, except it's not even enjoyably bad, and I don't even think Birdemic was enjoyably bad. I think it was just bad, and this is worse than Birdemic. I've never seen Birdemic. So, it is really quite staggering. Well, you have I this have a podcast for you, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> you have this absolutely awful, awful family who just keep getting everyone around them killed, plants, animals, all sorts, and for some reason we're supposed to continue to root for them. And then things just keep happening that are never followed up on. Like one of the like the lead character, I suppose, for all intents and purposes, is meant to have become deaf due to a car accident, but because she could hear beforehand they cop out and just allow her to talk all the time and yeah. the fact that she's not meant to be able to hear anything is just very quickly forgotten after you know the outbreak internal logic yeah goes out the pretty window. much and then yeah. people keep getting injured but the injuries don't seem to affect them in any way and my absolute favourite thing was how two days into this apocalypse with these actually kind of cute little bat creatures like they're just flying around looking for some food at this point, they've also sacrificed the family dog, which, you know, way to go to... Uh, yeah. To the yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 audience. Well, the audience, audience, in the audience in general, everybody cares about the dog. But, um, no, yeah, no, then... You kill a dog well. I Am Legend, I think, killed the dog well. No, uh, Spoilers, by the way. But it was um, very sad, is the point. Yeah. And this he didn't sad. want to do it. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, anyway, so we're like two days into the <laughs> apocalypse and they're holed up like it's a feckin' walking dead or something. And then out of nowhere, this bunch of cult people show up and they're like oh, we need to, like, rob the girl because she's fertile. It's like, it's two days into the apocalypse. What are you worried about? Two days? Yeah. It's like, lads, Literally, we're already like, setting up for the yeah, future world then, order. Yeah, and then they stage this attack in, like, the, the house, and then there's lightning, and dreadful. I have no idea what's going on. It's like, there's some weird I, granny figure who's, like, the granny at a Dante's Peak who sacrifices herself for no reason. It's so bad. Luke, who is a, was a guest of the podcast and Stanley last week. Tucci is in this. Yeah. WTF. And uh, what's her name from Sabrina? The Kernan Shipka. Kernan Shipka. Um, yeah. Mad Men. And, uh, uh, from Mad Sabrina, Men and yes. obviously Sabrina yeah. from Twitch. Uh, Luke of this parish has seen the film. Um, he has described it as terrible. Uh, so Grace says, he mentioned to me that, and maybe you can verify this, is there a scene in the middle of the apocalypse where a teenager who's like being hunted by creatures that hunt based on sound takes a video call or Skype of some description yes. on his phone. Yeah. Well, hang on, what? Yeah. Ah, You're in the middle of the apocalypse. Lads, you got to keep it. Oh, yeah, and they, they have this sort if of... you can't make personal time, Jay... <laughs> yeah, but they have this Facebook conversation going back and forth, and they're just like, if we just go north, everything will be fine. And then at the end, and I'm going to spoil this, because none of you are going to watch this because it's tripe, um, they go to this mysterious north wherever it is and they're just living in the woods perfectly fine with a fucking bow and arrow sorry like <laughs> like they, they just watched the Hunger Games and decided this is what they were going to do like it's oh lord it was so big in outrageous. 2017 outrageous. Hunger Games was big in 2017 can I just say Grace though yeah you say earlier you said earlier you kind of started on prefaced or kind of talking about this film with like you know there's no even enjoyment from a bad film I'll go towards you watch Gotti it is available on Netflix, actually. And it's all incredibly all entertaining. See, I could, but what, do. what else could I be watching while I'm watching Gotti? Well, you catch. won't be watching whatever that is. What's this called? Birdemic? No, it's the word Silence. Silence. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't mention Bear Grylls here. Yes, I mean, well, one episode of Bear Grylls left. I'm very sad. But please watch Gotti. Okay. He was 12 I want years you old. I can't wait he to. He didn't have a hair on his prick. Yeah, see, that's not endearing me. <laughs> it's, but it, it's... Honey, I know you're sad, but we got four other kids. I it's can amazing. watch 13 it's... hours again and, and tell please, you again please watch how much I love it. I want, if you're going to watch terrible films, at least watch the heavyweight champion of terrible films. <laughs> okay, okay. I would have rather got cancer than you get a hair hurt on your head. Good it's... Lord. Yeah. The cool. Oscar goes to. <laughs> this is just going to be the year of Gotti, which is people just talking. I'm never going to have so much chance of making several of the top tens at the end of the year. My I mean, stars. it won't make any. It it's, in my, it's one of the worst films I've ever seen. But <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> New York City, the greatest fucking My city. city. Greatest fucking Look city. Look to ever. camera, be serious. <laughs> Oscar <laughs> clip, baby. <laughs> it's so terrible. Yeah. Right. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Calm down now. <laughs> um, and then the last You've film I mentioned. The, system, the last film I'll mention is Miss Sloan, which I just watched last night. Um, this feels like it was sort of maybe overlooked in release, but I cannot recommend it highly enough. I absolutely loved it. It was such a tour to force of a film and probably the type of film that these days you most commonly like the the subject matter is something you would expect to see in a very sort of prestigious tv miniseries that has that sort of air about it because it's about kind of loosely the um 
lobbying industry in DC and um, the titular Miss Sloan Jessica Chastain's character basically decides she's going to leave her current position um, which is very amoral if any of them can be moral lobbying firm and go and work for someone else to try and push a gun control bill that has or so it would seem no chance of passing and it kind okay. of just evolves from there it's um it's just a very rich like textually um what's the word i'm looking for vivid work like there's there's so much talking in it it's you almost forget what it's like to watch a film where it's just constant quick witticisms being thrown back and forth um but it's just it's really really intense and my nerves were just completely shredded watching it because obviously when you're talking about something like gun control which is a very heated topic and um continues to be a source of much contention and debate in the states and indeed for the rest of the world looking at the states going WTF is wrong with you and so on yes, and so yes. forth um, it's hard not to get very emotionally invested in that but just I just got really caught up in the way it portrayed this world of completely amoral characters who have reasons for doing what they do to help them sleep at night and then Miss Sloan um, as a character is such a rich layered nuanced character and such an opportunity for Jessica Chastain to play yeah. in terms of allowing her someone that she can really use every inch of her talent to embody she goes from being incredibly unlikable to being likable to being heroic to being villainous to having you know some semblance of morals and righteousness to having absolutely none no personal life no insight beyond this incredibly like steel cast iron demeanor and just like by the time it gets to the end i just felt like i was backing further and further away from the screen until i was in the next room and then it drops this kind of twist on you at that um also makes you reconsider everything you've just watched. Basically, it was just just quite breathtaking. I've never seen it. I was uh, not prepared for how involved I would get in it. I'm aware of it, but I've, I've never seen it. Well, Justine is phenomenal. Um, mm. Justine is, I was less fond of the film itself than I think Grace was, but Justine is great, and she's really good at this, as you pointed out, this sort of like talky uh, sort of modern film, mm -hmm. which is very rare that they exist, but Justine is very much the queen of them. She's also very good in Molly's Game, which is not which a good film, see. but she's, she's great. She's great at it, yeah. She's great. The film is, is arguably less so, yeah. but she's also very, 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 very good here. Mm -hmm. This is very much a showcase for Justine. Just absorbs for the whole it. frame. Phenomenal. Um, and great cast as well. Like It's always good to see Jake Lacey in there as well. <laughs> and uh, Mark Strong doing his trademark quite poor American accent. <laughs> it's not a strong Jake Lacey again? Mm. Uh, he was in Their Finest. Come on. Oh, yeah, yeah. I like their finest. He's, <laughs> I like his positive associations with Jake Lacey. He was also so in... favourite Dunkirk movie. He was also in Rampage. Yeah. Okay, that was a film. Fine. All right, fine. Anyway, sorry. I watched that because of you, there. <laughs> Don't put that on me. I literally... I am literally putting it on you. Okay. You have ruined him. Great. Um, oh, sorry. That's it, I think. The only I've been watching loads of Bear Grylls, which I'm not going to annoy Jay by bringing up, but also a Netflix series called One Strange Rock, which I also highly recommend, which is about lots of, I suppose, earth science is the best way you could describe it. It has a panel of astronauts, um, including the um, ever-famous Chris Hadfield, talking about various aspects of the earth, like where oxygen comes from, the influence of the sun, how the earth was made, all this sort of stuff. It's just it's really, really fun. Darren Aronofsky was involved, but don't let that put you off. I'm Will Smith. And Will Smith hosts it, yeah. But there's a minimal Will Smith. And that's that good. Is that's a problem say, for anyone. A little bit of Will Smith goes a long way yeah. sometimes. But it's shot absolutely beautifully, and it's just so really informative and and and. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of kind of like a weird meditation experience in some ways mm -hmm. because there's just a lot of lovely natural kind of panoramic yeah. shots and and talks about our our place in the the universe and how we're all very small and part of a much wider network of things and it's just except for Niall, who's really tall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Noel is still a pebble compared yes, to Jupiter. He is, but, but big, I'm, a, I'm a dot in that regard. I'm not even visible. I think this might provide a nice segue to talking about films that Jay may have seen this week, possibly. Have oh, I seen any? Jay. Well, let's see. I'm going to point out just before I start that uh, I, every time Grace mentioned Bear Grylls during the week, I tell we are him, the, we are kill Bear Grylls for I'm every chance you very got. intrigued by the Bear Grylls thing. I'm not sure I have the moral strength to withstand it, though. I wasn't aware that Bear Grylls was uh, such a polarizing character until this week because I said this to a few people in work and they all well made similar expressions to what you would have said. Jay. Yeah, good. He was like, he was uh, he was popular for like a week and then people was like, oh, and then he became annoying, isn't he, he became unbearable. Yeah, he did. Yeah, well, I honestly parents. have no strong opinions on Bear Grylls. I didn't know this many people were. I, I think it's a level of fame him. and the speed at which he accrued it and the fact that he sort of that parlayed into celebrity, like also, stuff like yeah. Bear Grylls disappearing into the wild with. Uh, he ben does Stiller. have like no personality and whatsoever. Barack Obama. So yeah. it's hard to imagine him being famous. Also, he had a thing where he had to explain editing at one point. 
because he was it was inferred that he did something and he didn't actually do it but editing made it look like he did do it on one of his natural his shows. I'd say that happens quite a lot no it yeah, does no, but I think he got cut out did he get a he grilling inf- on it did he mm. yeah hopefully uh, but uh, yeah anyway uh, that's I just I want him dead in all the graces uh, well, okay. that's all I'm saying all right. not, it's not real dead Darren it's pretend dead I assume left. I'll do my maybe best. in the last episodes he actually dies if you uh, do it so bear that mind Grace <laughs> <laughs> sorry that was an unintentional <laughs> pun uh, you did it! Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Right. Only natural. We, we kick off uh, where every podcast should kick off. Uh, after a gap, a suitable gap of probably about 20 years, uh, I watched Roadhouse. Yo. Which I know Grace has watched recently again. Um, This is great. Um, I, really I've kind of forgotten most of it, uh, bar that the bar is terrible that they're in. In a kind of Blues Brothers cage in front of the singers kind of way, like which I always yeah, love. Yeah, because they keep throwing I, bottles at them. Hilarious. That. Um, and the poor like lead musician is blind. Too, yeah, yeah, and yeah. he can't even see when people yeah. are throwing. But bottles he can at sense him. him. He's had enough <laughs> bottles thrown his way, I think. Um, oh, but it's great. It's, <laughs> it's one of those great urban westerns, like uh, that that came out probably kind of in the eighties and stuff as well. But he tends to pop up every so often. Oh, yeah, that's Reagan's America. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Cowboy and president. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. A cowboy. And this, this is the end of the eighties. So yeah. this is the end of the Reagan era yeah. kind of presidency. And Rooks. yeah, it's like he's he's literally a stranger that wanders into town <laughs> where he's living, has horses on their ranch, and mm-hmm. and he's living in a barn and and, and even like when he goes, the, yeah, 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 yeah. When he goes to the house, there's these wonderful. It's almost like a plantation. Oh, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fields. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's a massive lake. Yeah. And it, but it leans very heavily into it, and, it, and it's, it's happy, and it's very aware of that. Yeah. Uh, but it's mixing it with a kind of uh, we want the piece of that Arnie Sly, Bruce Willis cash mm-hmm. that they've all been making. But he's not. But with a higher class. But I think the <laughs> thing it is, I, I, I John Bourne, uh, who was full star on Twitter and is very very good. I had a chat with him about this because he's a huge fan of it, and he's saying, and he makes a really good point, and he's he's absolutely on the money. And that kind of derided up kind of nature of Schwarzenegger and uh, Stallone in the eighties, which are the real muscly, uh, you know, kind of uber men yeah. superhero kind of things. Yeah, the, the, uh, again, the hyper masculine yeah, yeah. era. There's this Whereas, muscle, yeah. you're saying like uh, the post Vietnam. This is yeah, what yeah. the American man. Swayze looks stands like. out because Swayze is a uh, he's almost balletic and yeah. quiet mm-hmm. and is even sexually. Does sexuality is even ambiguous to a certain degree? Like it, there's a lot of kind of modern kind of feel to him, even still. Yeah, he's quite non-violent. Years no, he is. Yeah, yes, exactly. So. He's, it's a peace-loving guy. And I mean, as you point out, like it's his biggest role at this point with Dirty Dancing and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, uh, and there's a few references to Dirty Dancing in there, which I appreciated. Yeah, but also, uh, I mean, his motto is literally "Be nice yeah. until it's time to not be yeah. nice." Yeah, and he's great. Like he's really good in this. Like he, mm. he's he looks great. He is great. He can he, like he he can act in so far as you can act in a film like this. Like this. Um, he has Sam Elliott looking coming out of a holy god Sam <laughs> Elliott was good looking wasn't he you know he was he's been hiding behind the stash for a long time uh, you know that older kind of tash. hiding you know what I mean there's a lot of hair going on there's though. a lot of hair you know, so and a kind of stubbly hair. kind of thing on it it yeah. was great you just build a imagine nice the portion state of your bathroom afterwards that's all I'm going to say and to complete the Big Lebowski kind of reunion with Sam Elliott Ben Gazzara is uh, having an absolute ball as a villain it kind of wanders around only the town and owning everyone. It, it's such nonsense. And I've never, honestly, never seen as many punches or kicks to the balls in a film. <laughs> there are so many, so, so many. And I really appreciate that. I, I like to kind of almost start, oh, I should have started counting earlier to see how many there actually was, but I didn't. Take a shot every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Center. Somebody else takes a shot. Mm. Um, I loved it. Uh, it's great fun. Um, and I'll revisit. So, John Bourne also pointed out that I hadn't seen the, what the hell's the name of the film, with uh, Swayze and Liam Neeson. From the same time, uh, it's a kind of a gangster film. Oh, right. Okay. I now can't think of the goddamn name. Interesting. But, uh, to the Google's, Darren. Well, I well, well, I uh, dazzled the audience with uh, nonsense, but uh, that I should actually watch because uh, again, pr- perhaps not as good as Roadhouse is the word, but uh, very entertaining nonetheless. So, whatever the hell the name of it is, I'm going to watch of it. Kin, Next of Kin, that's the one. Yeah. Um, 1989. Yeah, and, and it's wearing a cowboy hat. Yes, exactly right. My <coughs> so uh, I'm going to watch that. Uh, but John Bourne. And Liam Neeson is wearing Look. a trucker hat. Oh my god. We are in. You do forget that Liam Neeson was ever young, never mind. Yeah, I know, right? Hmm? Ronan did suggest we do a scan on Movie Club. That never really took off. We kind no. of tried it with Gotti, but I think we could do it with Exit Kim. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think we'd all be in that. But anyway, you should follow Foo Star on Twitter. He's great. Yeah. Um, I'd follow up that with a film on uh, the Criterion Channel. Um, last year, I would have banged on a bit about uh, Vera. Chilatova, I'm going to say, a Czech filmmaker who made a film called Daisies, which is one of the best ones ever made. Um, 
it's one of those anarchic Hold on, weird sorry nightmares. to interrupt there, but apparently Bill Paxton is also in next. Oh, then game. sold, sold. Just saying, just right saying. Let's I'm not in. bury the lead. Let's do it. Continue. Uh, but Daisy's is an incredible anarchic comedy that has to be seen to be believed, and I think it's about eighty something minutes long. Anyway, it's great. Uh, so with the revamp of the Criteria Channel, I watched one of our previous films, which is called Something Different, which is our first film. Um, and this is a really interesting film. It's about uh, the difficulties women have and the lies they kind of tell themselves to keep going in a world that doesn't really care for them. And particularly in a uh, Chilitova, and I bet you that's not her pronunciation, but anyway, uh, she was the only, in the Czech New Wave, she was the only woman filmmaker. Um, and I suspect there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, autobiography. Yeah, informed it very much so. Uh, this is really great it kind of centers on it's kind of a weird documentary fiction thing it's one 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 of the ladies is a a essential to women one of them is a gymnast ready to compete for Czechoslovakia and they out of Czechoslovakia at the time in the world championships and another one who's a kind of harried uh, housewife who's married to this kind of dope and but she's a kind of kid that's a bit of a nightmare and she's kind of frustrated with all the time in her life and it starts off with this incredible shot where you this this kind of close-up of the gymnast doing a lot of kind of floor work and it pulls back and you realize the kid and the mother are watching on tv and it doesn't look like at all you were watching the tv it's an incredible shot and as a debut kind of camera work it's frequently astonishing here and it's kind of has this kind of counterpoint to each other's lives you don't think interconnect anyway that's the only point of intersection but you get this these kind of parallel stories about kind of women's choices in in the world and particularly in i think it was what 63 this was um absolutely fascinating the camera work is incredible the the editing that links them like they don't meet but that there's this subtle and beautiful editing that somebody will lift something or you know hold something up and then it'll it'll cut to the leg of the gymnast moving in the same kind of pressure yeah. so that's kind of beautiful editing elegant, all the time sort of really like elegant and graceful really. and superb um, I, I I did tweet a little kind of twenty second clip of it, uh, which is this upside down camera work, which is, which is the unbelievable. With the dancer, yeah. Like it's it's like I've I seen that today. I'd be wowed. Well like this is like forty five years or fifty years ago. It's it's absolutely astonishing. Um, it's a great film, uh, and I think there's two or three more on the uh, Criterion Channel from her, and I will be watching days. So Over a of them. thousand films on there, I believe. Yes, I will be pimping it out every week, literally. So you know, if you're bored, <coughs> tough. Uh, I rewatched Jupiter, Jupiter Ascending, keeping my Wachowskis that was a segue going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That is quite like, a segue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, well, from Grace's, like, we're all tiny compared to Jupiter, I was like, hey. Oh, right, sorry. I'm terrible at that kind of thing. He didn't get the Sorry, I didn't I miss was... that completely. Sorry. No, it was like I was queuing you up. I, I'm terrible at these things. Okay. Do more research, Jake. Um, Jupiter Ascending is great. Um, it's kind of a mess and absolute kind of? shambles, right? Kind of a mess. It is pretty shambolic, yeah. but there's a lot to like about it. Narratively, it's an absolute shambles. Yeah. Everything else is great, though. Mm-hmm. It makes no sense, it's, really, right? And it doesn't yeah. really follow. Like, I mean, but it doesn't really matter. I don't, like, I don't particularly love it, but I like it and I admire it, which is... Whatever about the Wachowskis, and this is the thing I was talking about after watching this, um, I am, and I haven't seen everything, the only one I haven't seen of theirs is Speed, Speed Racer. Racer, which I will get to. Um, which is an experience. Yes. I am never bored by a Wachowski yeah. film. And wherever about anything else that, like as a minimum point, that should be a standard for people that make film. And it almost never is. Like, you shouldn't be bored watching film ever. Like, and the Wachowskis were never, they throw enough on screen, effects wise, camera work wise, uh, known positioning people where they're supposed to be in action sequences, which these things seem, their action sequences are generally clean, you know exactly what's going on. And these things seem like standards that, should, should be, be there but they're not met easily <laughs> and it, it really bugs me when I'm watching a lot of blockbusters where I was like what the fuck is going on here and then we can get an old of my like eyes slow cuts. yeah yeah and I, I blame Greengrass a little bit on the Bourne movies as kind of influence in a way and Bay and all yeah yeah but well. yeah, yeah and that kind of you know, if we can show 19 cuts of two people punching each other, then surely that shows more of a fight it's like no it doesn't because I can't see fucking anything that's like 38 punches Jay yeah I know right too many punches uh but anyway, it's great. Uh, I really like it. Tatum's having the ball. Gunas is great. Uh, even what's his face, who I despise, Redmayne is like this is such a plum, weird I role. Think of it's film, such a shouty, weird, strange. Yeah, role. and he's doing this weird voice that whenever uh, weird, I think of this film, it's I the, remember it's, it's Lupita and us. I, I, I know oh, that, God, that's where yes. he based it, right? <laughs> yes, right. Because everybody's already forgotten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's yeah, already yeah. forgotten any Redmayne Oscar winner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I do love that they tried to, to norm it. I, um, I remember reading a review, which I think may have been Mark Kermode, but I'm not sure. But he said something like, Red Main sounds like he's trying to fillet the concept of eternity itself or something. <laughs> <laughs> that has always <laughs> stayed with me. That's a great line. <laughs> just like, I do love Kermode. That but, makes it sound more enjoyable <laughs> than it actually was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. But anyway, for the, eternity, I suspect. Like Jupiter Ascendant is is inconsequential. Like it, it like it. I know. It doesn't I'm, I'm the Wachowski but it, it's, majority of people have probably forgotten it even exists. I but there's really all that stuff with the bees. And Sean Bean is in it, and doesn't Sean Bean. die. He doesn't die. Yeah, he doesn't die. And he punches the head off Shannon Tatum for ages. Which yeah, is really you are now, fun. which is something we all dream. Yeah, 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 indeed. Uh, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, it. Like it's nonsense, but it, if all nonsense was as good as that nonsense, we'd be in a lot better place. We'd be in a richer world. We would. Mm. Um, I moved on then to a film called Thou Wast Mild and Lovely which is the I'm not sure if it's the debut poetic. you hit indeed it's a lovely title uh, it's a, it's either the debut or the second film from Josephine Decker who made Madeline's Madeline which is coming to movie which is coming next, next and cinemas, cinemas and movie next month yeah um, <coughs> this is one of our earlier films and this is on movie I think I suspect it's celebrated um, I hadn't seen this I huge fan of Madeline's Madeline really loved it this is not that it's okay, oh, okay. Um, it's a real it has real promise Deckard's an extraordinary eye and if you watch if you do watch Madeline's Man you can see that and there's some absolutely thrilling and quite beautiful moments captured here it's kind of a story of a young guy that comes to the, goes to work on this farm he's left a kind of relationship and there's a father and daughter there and it has this kind of thing where you know he keeps looking at the daughter and the father's a bit so it's kind of that generic kind of setup of the dad's not happy with this, but he has needs to help on the farm kind of thing. But it's a bit more poetic than that. Okay. But, but 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 That's it's, the it's basic kind of, but it's covering up a lot of basic narrative stuff that's yeah. been done before. Yeah. Um, There's so, nothing wrong with that if you're doing. No, it's not. There, I think technically it's done well. Story wise, it it has a couple of tonal shifts that don't quite work, and the characterization is a little thin. Um, the forms are great. Um, and they're like if you if you hadn't seen Madeline's Madeline and this is the film you watch, you go. Okay, it's not great, but the promise, there's, there's real promise here, and it, it's more than fulfilled in the following film. But, uh, well, worth catching, but not not brilliant overall. Okay. Uh, and two more quickly. Uh, I watched So Dark the Night, which was one of the Columbia Noirs on Criterion Channel, which is another Joseph This Lewis is another one for your 60 minute ones. Isn't yeah, it? it's 75, I think. So, um, it's, yep, almost it's a on lunch. really, really weird. <laughs> no, I mean, as compared to the last one. Oh, this, this is kind of odd. Is, oh, it's, this is not as good, is but it's a, okay, oddly but, weirder. But it's this set, escalates. It sets, it's set in France. Okay. Filmed in California. Uh, so it's, it starts off in this kind of studio lot Paris where this detective who go, needs a holiday. So he goes to this kind of small French village in the Californian uh, yeah. town. And, you know what's uh, remarkable? How England looks nothing like Southern California. Oh, no, none of it matters. <laughs> yeah. And in black and white you can probably get away yeah. with it more. But it has this weird day glow in a wire where he, he, <coughs> he, he stays in this little kind of hotel and there's a father and a mother and a kind of slightly evil kind of hostess in the hotel and then there's a daughter who he takes a shine to uh, but the daughter's already promised apparently to her kind of since childhood to this yeah. other guy so there's this kind of thing he falls for so there's a bit of a love triangle type thing going on and then <laughs> then and then she, and this happens early on so it's not a spoiler also it's from 1946 <laughs> uh, she's more found more than the daughter still too soon uh, yeah indeed right <laughs> and she's found murdered so he's the invest he, the police ask him to help stay on and investigate the murder and then subsequent murders take place and then it takes a weird left field turn in a kind of fairy tale strange way into a kind of part psycho territory which I not quite that but vibe certainly the that vibe that sort of, of like sensibility yeah yeah I really like this it's absolutely batshit uh, in the way that when your movies cost fucking nothing you can get nobody, away with you because can, you've got nobody can to it. Columbia yeah. are knocking these out and I can't wait to get the rest of them because, nope. and I'm rushing myself to one a week as, so as to make them last in case you don't have any more or if there's no more but uh, this is bonkers uh, it's, just, it's like the, the whole film and a world in 70 minutes it's ah oh, I loved it absolutely loved it and finally then to wrap up um, I went to the IFI on Wednesday with Ronan to catch one of the Donald the former curated the, uh, the, the Northern Ireland films which Ronan's at tonight as well and we saw Maeve which is uh, Pat Murphy's um, film from 1981 um, I'd heard great things about this over the years I'd never seen it and the fact it was screened I was like yeah I must, I must get to see it because I really wanted to see it and hoped it lived up to expectations and it more than lived up to it it is absolutely sensational um, it is this brilliant brilliant fractured narrative 
unbelievably well framed story of these of this young woman that comes back from kind of London to, to her family in Belfast and the, the kind of choices women make in Northern Ireland and to leave or to stay or even when the battle is over and the battle being the Irish Republican battle then women still have a battle to be recognised be recognised and to be equal citizens <coughs> and, and it's it's incredibly smart unbelievably well acted this, this kind of forms a testimony around stories and about statements about how the world is at that point about uh, it's a kind of a call to arms for women at the time particularly in Northern Ireland and that you know even like abortions mentioned in it and that's what 40 years ago and abortion is still not legal in Northern Ireland these kind of things like it seems remarkably prescient in this kind of way and that kind of demand for autonomy it's it, and it's beautifully shot I mean unbelievably well framed really strange bizarre sides wonderfully fragmented storytelling I absolutely adored it and it's one of those ones I just I knew as soon as it came out that I really 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 wanted to see it again straight away it's absolutely great and it is on the BFI player uh, but not on the IFI player and not as far as I can see uh, physical variations of it at the moment so in like a lot of Irish films that I've complained about for the last I don't know many years we cannot unless you catch them at the cinema on particular days you will not be able to see them which is really 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 irritating but you know we've been here before and no doubt in six weeks time we'll be here again so yeah that's me all right i had a relatively light week because i watched a whole bunch of new releases and some movies in the top 10 but i got caught up on because i had a week off i got to catch up on some of the stuff from last year or early this year that i'd missed and been looking forward to so first thing was hotel artemis uh which is fine yeah, uh, fine is about right. I'd say this. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. It's it's solidly mid tier sort of science fiction dystopian action movie where there's a limited budget on display, but you have a bunch of character actors. So you ram them all together and just watch what happens. Um, about right, yeah. It's about right. It's about mid tier for them. It benefits greatly from a fantastic cast, including people like Sterling K. Brown, who is just phenomenal and everything. Jodie, Jodie Foster, Foster, who is doing an inexplicable New York accent for a woman who has always lived in California. But we don't judge. Jodie, Jodie's knocked about in a bit of genre in the last few years. Jodie loves genre. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, which is great by the way that seems like it should be a season no, at the eye yeah, like Jodie Loves Genre I would watch the hell out of that yeah. uh, I've, I've been a massive massive Jodie Foster fan for a long long time so I'm happy to watch her in pretty much anything and I pretty much will but this this isn't great but it, yeah, if you want to watch Jodie Chew the Scenery and Sterling K. Brown do his thing it's, it's, it's well, worth it is. Like I mean the cast is, is the main selling point here. Yeah. I mean like just to rhyme them off off the top of your head you've got Jeff Goldblum Brian Tyree Henry Jenny Slate Zachary Quinto Charlie Day even Dave Batista, who is like when you use ah, him very Batista. well he's yeah. great yeah like he's he's really good. I'm a healthcare professional. Um, it probably doesn't deserve doing the some cast. Fantastic work yeah. in the WWE but again. That's is he? Yeah. yeah. I didn't know he was back. There you go. Back with a nose ring. Ooh, nose ring. Yeah. What? I believe That's the nose ring gambit. may have forcibly been removed recently. Okay. Ah. It was a plot point, but yes. But uh, <laughs> the the issue is that like while it has this great cast and it has these wonderful sounding sets, it doesn't necessarily have the character work to back it all. No, it does. In particular, like there's a lot of points in the film where characters do things not because it makes sense for them as characters to be doing these things, but instead because the film requires somebody to do something in order yeah. to move the plot forward. There's a lot of that in there, so it does it sort of undercut a little bit, which is a shame because I generally like these sort of films. It's interesting of itself because it's very much a '90s throwback in the way that we've been seeing recently things like, for example, um, Captain Marvel earlier in the year, uh, but. <laughs> <clears throat> sorry and other things as well and there's something interesting in the way that it uses its 90s nostalgia because it's very specifically a movie about california in the 90s through the lens of science fiction allegory in that it's a story about the los angeles riots it's a story about like the entire film is set against this idea of los angeles tearing itself apart yeah. there's a recurring motif of these rich wealthy people inside this hotel artemis the eponymous hotel artemis walking into rooms and closing curtains so they can keep out the sound of insanity and noise outside that's fascinating because it kind of fits within a broader trend of like 90s nostalgia that's exploring los angeles in the 90s i'm thinking of things like for example the american crime story uh oj simpson the people for yes. OJ simpson but even like oj made in america as well which try to contextualize this idea of, like, even history. the assassination of jennifer yeah. Yeah. But yeah, but was even... that the nineties? I've no idea. I can't remember. Now. I think it was the nineties sometime. Yeah, I think so. Can't well. remember the exact year though. I ninety seven. I'm gonna guess. Kind of fascinating because it, it kind of reminds me a bit of like the X Files revival in that what it's doing is it's using this weirdly specific science science fiction allegory from the nineties 
uh, in a way that is very pointedly relevant today in that like i think that there's a lot of stuff in particularly in american politics today that you can trace back to 90s california like yeah. i mean like you could argue that things like ferguson for example or even like the, the modern civil rights movement trace their roots back to that sort of thing but even like the emergence of trumpism from yeah. california with like stephen miller being a californian republican and stuff like that so it's fascinating to sort of see that kind of coming around again and even within that then you have this idea of like nested sort of nostalgia this 90s nostalgia for the 70s where you have this idea of like the Wolf King who's played by Jeff Goldblum as another ex-hippie conman yeah. who traded his beads for bullets and this sort of cynicism that you had in the 90s towards the revolution of the 60s and all this stuff echoed back in and it's interesting it doesn't quite work doesn't quite come together but I, I didn't mind it I was quite glad to see it um, finally Jay you'll be pleased to hear I also watch Glass finally Darren I've only been saying this for like six months Jesus it is definitely a film that is what oh. it is it's not good uh, it's bad in fact but the issue with Glass Darren if you say it's bad I am, I am, I'm running for the hills yeah um, we're going to see a J-shaped hole in the door let's, <laughs> let's let's just let me explain the issues of Glass in a single scene Right, there's on, a maybe. moment towards the climax of the movie where the two villains who are teaming up together have broken out of the psychiatric institution. Oh my God, Bruce Willis, who is the hero of the piece, is going to have to stop them. They're going to face off in the front yard of this psychiatric institution with the police called and a van full of like hostages and civilians trapped in the middle of it. The characters are staring at the monitors, watching the security footage, their eyes agog, terror crossing their faces. And then the lead character, the title character's mother, explains what is happening by saying... Does she say her name is Martha? No, she doesn't say it's Martha. Sad. But she explains that my son, Glass, told me that this is what normally happens in a limited edition comic book. At the certain point, the heroes and villains will fight each other, showcasing their power. And this is a direct line of dialogue. I believe it's called a showdown. This is a movie that assumes that the audience has not only never read a comic book, but also never seen a film before. Are you or sure did... she wasn't being ironic? No, the film seems entirely but serious. The thing of it is, like, if you're watching this, surely the likelihood is you've seen um... a superhero film, or no, the, even the two previous predating films yeah, that would uh, link it Glass up, and, like, and, and, and like awareness of superhero lore. Yeah, it would be even sort of like even idiots like me who know practically none of superheroes yeah, like, I mean, knows that. This is weird because it's very clear that Shyamalan like loves superhero loves superhero stories and yeah. loves the genre and stuff like that. But the understanding in the film is very much again you don't talk nineties nostalgia. It's very much in the nineties style of like superhero engagement, where you go to a comic store and there's a wall with neon lights marked villains and one marked heroes because that's apparently how comic book stores arrange their issues. If that if you're to be believed, and if you want to know about villains, you can just go and read in the villains section or something. Maybe like the that. ones in M Night Shyamalan's life. Or sort of things like, like this. Can I just say though, and I, I have a hot take here. I said a while ago, and I'm gonna stand with this though. In the, in the, I don't know what there's a Renaissance word with Shyamalan. Shyamalan. That's the one. Yeah, I'm not even gonna attempt that. I don't think he was ever a very good filmmaker. Jay, that's and a very, very predictable stop. statement. Yeah, that's not really there. a hot take. All right, it's a cold take then. Whatever it is, like, how many? Good films has he made compared to how Signs. many bad films has he? I I'll said go good with films, Sense. Grace. Six Sense, Signs Unbreakable, and I'll go with Signs as well. And I'll probably give Signs is great. The Visit, no, and I like not. Split it's, is an interesting. Oh, and film. The Visit is quite good. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Probably too. Split doesn't work as an interesting film. And this is the thing: Stop. there are interesting parts of this as well. Like, there's there's this weird, and again, it's almost a moral panic with the character played by Sarah Paulson, who at one stage delivers Sarah the... Paulson. She's great, but she plays basically this Jeremiah Arkham figure who's running the psychiatric institution for superheroes. And she delivers the line in the way that Sarah Paulson can, where it's pure schlock, but she's giving it her all. She always does Comic that. books are an obsession. Um, as if, and you get this sense that like Shyamalan's maybe playing with this idea and kind of like in some ways maybe trying to do something interesting with the form. There's a sense, and again, if you are being cynical, Jay, and I suspect that you might be, you would I argue might. that like what Shyamalan does with the action sequences is try to disguise the fact that he's not an action director. The, the film's action sequences do not work as superhero punch-ups. If one were generous, and I'm inclined to be generous when dealing with this sort of thing, I would argue that maybe he's making a point about how you shoot these things and what you try to do mm. and what you try and show and what you don't show. And sort of like the use of the, his use of framing and editing in these sequences is a point of itself. The denial of the satisfaction of the superhero, I believe it's called a showdown. Um, but but yeah. maybe he just doesn't know how to do it. 
I I I, I accept that. That's why I preface the comment. No, but uh, but but in in terms of talking about it though, would you think that's the case? I think Shyamalan is, and again, this is the thing where I am more generous towards Shyamalan than you are. I think he's quite good at the things that he's good at. I don't. I think that he has limitations. I do I, too. The question is, and this is always the question of Shyamalan, is how aware is he of, as a director and a writer of his own limitations? So is... Early on in his career, you would suggest he wasn't. And particularly like The Lady in the Water is like the prime example of that. But even The Happening is also an example. And part of me is more inclined to suspect that maybe he is aware. Maybe like his decision to shoot the action sequence like something from a thriller as opposed to an action beat where you've got lots of you know shots that are obscured or filmed through glass or like cowering glass, or hiding. Yeah. Ah, see what he did there. Yeah. yeah, but it just, it doesn't add up. And the problem is it's far too long. It's two hours and ten minutes long. <laughs> and, no, 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 no. And the lead character, right? The character whose name is on the poster, who's nominally the focus point of this film, only appears 40 minutes into the film. His first appearance is 40 minutes into the film. Is that the James McAvoy character? No, that's that's the glass character played by Samuel Jackson. Oh, right, shit. I always mix these up. I haven't, yeah. seen, I haven't seen a break in a long time. 40 minutes. 40 minutes until glass appears in glass. That'd shatter your expectations, wouldn't it? I know, it is a bit of a pain if you ask me. Yeah. Uh, Interesting thing, and I'm kind of curious about this one, uh, and I'll maybe throw this over to the listeners if they have some thoughts on this, but there's an interesting and in inverted commas use of a shamrock tattoo at a certain point in the film, and I wonder how self-aware Shyamalan was in the use of shamrock tattoos as a okay. symbol of white supremacy. Um, and uh-huh. I wonder if maybe he's getting at something. White like supremacists have ruined everything. Oh, they absolutely right. have. The, 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 right? Do you get it? Come on. Come on. I, I got it. I got it. I, got it. I do appreciate it. All right, then. So you with that people. in mind, then we're going to... What do you mean, you, you people? people. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're going to totally move Totally unappreciated in your turn, <laughs> Jay. Know, right? The week in film news. And oh, we finally. Hit me. We have couple... a bumper issue. We have a bumper issue of film news. Let's start close to home with the IFI's Memory on Film sequence, uh, which Take is running in from 11th of May through to the 29th of May. Uh, where you can buy tickets. Well, okay, well, first of all, we'll run through the program. Yes. So it's opening on the 11th of May, Saturday, at uh, 4 p.m. with Rashomon. They're following it up the next day with Wild Strawberries. Uh, then on Tuesday, it's last year in Marimbad. Uh, Which is exceptional. Armour Court on the following Saturday. Which I have not seen. The Long Day Closes on Sunday. Memento on Thursday, which unfortunately clashes with our recording session, or else so I'd be there. there'll be no podcast. There'll be no podcast. Because uh, I'm not seeing it, so, uh, you know, you'll well, be talking like, to yourself, Darren. I'm missing the Nolan at I'm the same time. Nolan what a life. Whenever he's talking about Nolan, he's usually talking to us. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Sling, we are Grace. a completely Sling. unappreciative audience. Well, well, set, well set up. Nice. <laughs> On the following Saturday, it's Spider, which is massively underrated. Spider is one of my one top of three Cronenbergs. I really, yeah. really love it. And practically no one has seen it. That people I have not seen it. It's Gabriel Byrne and Ray Fiennes. Gabriel Byrne in a Cronenberg movie. Hey, and he is great. But this is this is one of the points that sort of pivots between like early Cronenberg and late Cronenberg it's, as well. It's, it's weird phenomenal. and strange. It's great. Uh, yeah, I think you'd like it, Grace. It's very I, odd and very wonderful and very strange. And I would I would mm. second that recommendation as well for what it's worth. And then on the Sunday, it's Eternal Sunshine the Spotless Mind. I'm, I'm curious to revisit it because it's every... Every 20 year old bro's favourite film when I was growing up, including my I own. I don't like it. Uh, would you not revisit? Oh, I'm fascinated. I've revisited revisit. it twice. Yeah. We had to watch it oh, in really? college again, and I was like, this is tripe. And everyone looked at me like I'd. I don't think it's tripe, but I, I, I've certainly cooled on it as the years have gone on, although I do appreciate. I just think it's awful. It's a really miserable, awful film. It is miserable. I mean, it's a Charlie Kaufman film. I yeah. don't see what the point of it all is. You'd never wanted to raise your mind of people, Grace? No. Of particular really? persons or feelings or because then you won't you won't get the learnings out of it either. Sure. Some people never learn. I mean, and that is that is arguably the point of the film, though. But I mean, I yeah, I, it's just awful. It's not yeah. a pleasant watch. It's I I'm fascinated by it. I I I used to really really love it. I've killed on it and sometimes rewatch it. But I'm still fascinated by it. Though. I think there's something in there. And then also uh, the final two films of the festival are Hidden, which is on Tuesday the 20th, which is an absolute masterpiece. Which I believe you're looking forward. Yes. To. And then finally, I do not care if we go down in history as barbarians. Ronan, this is a Romanian film, I think, and Ronan it's mentioned not a Trump it. Watch, uh, I hope. No, I've heard nothing as about. it. I've never even heard of it. Ronan has assured me that I should see it, and that's good enough for me. Perfect. Um, and you can also buy. Uh, so basically, there's you can buy tickets individually, but you can also buy a multi pass. Uh, like like you're buying oranges on Murray Street, five for forty five. Get your pretty, cinema pretty tickets. Pretty good, uh, to be honest. Like, it I is could, pretty good. Uh, if you can't find five films that you like, I'm, that, I'm I mean, away. I think for the first three films, so I will get my oranges slash film tickets when I come like, back. In off a big off pack. the top of my head, like Rashomon, Wild Strawberries, um, Memento, Spider. You know, I go with Eternal Sunshine. I should 
it's about seven of them I'm probably going yeah, no, I mean, to see it's, this it's stuff, a yeah. great lineup and it's very, pretty good uh, it's one of those nice seasons that kind of come together every so often not that they don't have other good seasons and, uh, no, they are great right. for but this, that particular one is really good and plenty of them at 35 minutes so. alright um, and actually we're going to stay with the IFI for the are second we? bit of news here which is basically and it's interesting because we talk a little bit we talk a great deal this podcast about Ireland's film history and how hard it is and how inaccessible it is mm. at times and stuff like that and particularly like the difficulty that we have maintaining it and making it accessible mm. to, to people so it's worth celebrating when that does happen and when it is made available. Ah, yes. The Irish Film Institute uh, today, actually, as, as we're recording this, uh, released the first volume of the Loopline Connection, uh, yes. Loopline Collection, which showcased materials from Loopline Film, one of Ireland's most influential production yes. companies, which was founded in 1992 by Shay Murray Shay Dawson. Dawson, yeah. yeah. Uh, but quiet yes. filmmaker made Dream of the Quiet Man and various other documentaries so there's there's a whole host of great stuff on there uh, the first volume of the collection which is available on the IFI player now includes uh, Leah McGrath's Essie's Last Stand which is a look at an elderly woman's fight to stay in her home as developers look to take over her apartment block for redevelopment evergreen uh, pretty evergreen story, theme yeah, yeah. Alive Alive O, A Requiem for Dublin, which is the, features the original poetry of Paula Meehan and examines the time when the livelihoods of Dublin's iconic street traders were under threat and when drugs became a scourge in the inner city. Oh, yeah. They the, could see the kip the city is now. Yeah. The film also includes cinematography from Robbie Ryan, who was also an yes. work on the favourite as yep. well. And uh, here's an interesting one. Looking On focuses on a vibrant inner city festival in 1982, spearheaded by activist Mick Rafferty and the late politician Tony Gregory, which featured an early rooftop appearance by, by none you other two. than you two. Tony Gregory was interesting. He was a really interesting Mick. politician back in the day uh, around uh, the kind of inner city Dublin and the fight against drugs and stuff. He's very, very good. My ick was directed at you two. Just oh yeah, I, I assumed that to be the case. <laughs> we, we all direct that ick. Just in case. You know, I hear you. And it's great to have that sort of availability. Pay your taxes. Stuff, to have that stuff <coughs> online where you can watch it, which is fantastic. Okay. Again, we're talking about like Irish, Ireland's cinematic history online. Yes. Uh, Loopline is very good. Uh, fun fact, I did an editing class with Shay Mary Doyle about 20 years ago uh, on a Steinbeck because I'm born in the 1940s, apparently. But he was very interesting and very informative and he was a terrific teacher. I learned jack shit now because I don't edit. But there you go. That's <laughs> life. That's just me, not him. It was a good experience. It was. It was a great experience. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. All right, let's take a broader look at Go International. A couple of big news in terms of like blockbusters this week. The uh, Star Wars Celebration Chicago happened uh, last weekend. Oh, sorry. Yes, go on. <laughs> with the announcement that the ninth film in the saga would be called The Rise of Skywalker. I am shocked. Yeah. Oh. And yeah. Twitter immediately went off. Well, I mean, it's a Star Wars movie. Of course, Twitter immediately went off. The alt-right of fandom. Exhausting. <laughs> Star Wars. It's yeah. so exhausting. I know. I just can't keep up. <laughs> like I just I watched this trailer. I was like, this trailer's kind of so so, but you know, there there could be potential. Looks better than the last. I thought it looked okay. My, shall not be I think I probably share um, the same thing. Title is Darren very did. underwhelming. But title is very underwhelming whatever. and sort of hints at uh, retconning, it, which is worrying. Hint, hints at giving I, I the think internet it's its too obvious. I would have thought so for retconning. Though. I think I think it's gone another way. And to be fair to the film of. so far, they have resisted a lot of the obvious stuff that they could have done. We'll see. Okay. Or not. Um, I have faith. But hey. Yeah. Which seems ironic coming it from It does, me. actually. Yeah. Yes, but Abrams is making this, so yes. I have a lot more faith. Okay. <laughs> and it also, yeah, so it, it also has the return of Ian McDermott as Palpatine, mm -hmm. um, and the crash wreckage of the Death Star, because you can never have a Star Wars movie without a Death Star. Mm -hmm. Fans, you I should never get that I have faith Death Star in The one. Force Awakens, technically. Yeah. A planet, a planet Death one. Star. I know. So... I, the, well, the entire Star Wars economy is Death Star derived. Um, <laughs> How many people the, died on that Death the Star? The procurement <laughs> issues alone would sink the this. But in any yeah. event, um, I do wonder though, like if it is Endor, I wonder if we'll be seeing an update of the adorable little Ewoks. From, oh like, God, I hope so. Just from, to send everyone doubly mad. But like from seventies style, adorable Viet Cong to, to like oh, twenty no. to twenty ten to twenty ten style, like adorable <sighs> jihadis. Never mind, like I that took it back. The next I will say that Return of the Jedi is the best Star Wars film there's ever been. That's all Not I'm the say best there's that. ever been, ever but been. it would be my favourite of the originals. Yeah, it's my favourite original. I by would some slightly distance. disagree with both of you, but I suspect we may have a forum to discuss that next Christmas. Will we? We may. Oh, Christ. <laughs> all right. Get, what did I get roped into? Also, the, the, uh, the Mandalorian trailer was released, which is the, the one new, now? Again, this is the Disney Plus thing that we discussed. <laughs> oh, so Jesus. Weird. I'm so tired. Yeah, there are so, so many. There's too much content, yeah. Darren. I'm the Somebody top. interesting is in this. And right. Disney owns everything. Where's the Herzog? Pedro Pascal. Where's the Herzog? Also, oh, Werner let's Herzog. not bury the lead. Uh, Carl, Weathers. Carl Weathers. Carl Weathers all right. is like the best right, I'm, I'm like manager. Okay, yeah, come on. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. Werner Herzog, right? I haven't yeah. watched this trailer yet. I haven't either. So I didn't even know it existed. 
And as we're I can't keep up. I keep seeing like Star Wars, such and such. I assume they're all games and never pay attention. Loot crates. <laughs> anyway, go on. Wow. That was a very hip reference. Oh, I know what the kids are arguing about these days in their Snapchats or whatever. Do, do, you, do no, you, Jay? Do you no, know what they're arguing? No, no, do I not know? I don't care. That was an attempted segue, but I do appreciate it. Thank you. You're uh, do you know what they're arguing about when it comes to Avengers Infinity War? Uh, Avengers Endgame. Do we want to know Aren't they arguing always about? arguing about everything when it comes to everything about That's everything? That's a fair point. Uh, but yeah, so there was leaked leak footage, right? Leak footage. Uh, you know what's wonderful minutes. though is that if you spend very little time on the internet and certainly very little time on Twitter, you don't notice any of this, really? and your life is immeasurably better. Which for is why it. I send you all this stuff. Uh, until you arrive in here and down ruins your it, life. I find it fascinating because you hear about people kicking off, and I'm like, is this actually real life or four fuckers on the internet arguing <laughs> with each other? Over I would and love over the idea of four fuckers on the internet yeah. as a kind of uh, four fuckers on the internet sounds like a great sitcom or a, or a jazz band. <laughs> like there's, I see sometimes. <laughs> People. Here we go. Let's get the beat. Sorry, oh, fuckers, yeah, coming at you right ironically, now. Ironically, perhaps on yeah. Twitter, saying sometimes like, "Is this actually a thing, or did somebody just write an article deciding it, it was a thing?" It can certainly and magnify a lot of the time, nonsense. That's what it feels like. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, anyway. I agree. But yeah, and uh, obviously then, obviously news going out there with the Russo brothers asking the uh, audience members to swear off spoilers, which is again interesting because it fits with that Thanos demand silence. Yep. Which has been going on as well. He's got a big hand in fairness. He'd, he'd punch you with it. He does, he does. And it's, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a just... fair point to make, I think. They're just kind of, like, my perspective on that is that, you know, this is something that means a lot to an incredible amount of people. It's been a really, really long time in the making. It's something that's quite unprecedented in the history of modern filmmaking. And I think for a small number of people to go out there and deliberately ruin that for other people, because you know there's some arseholes that will, like the Absolutely type of person guaranteed. who would stand up in a soapbox and broadcast Game of Thrones spoilers or something like people will always do this and I think it's fair enough for them to just be like you know what just be nice yeah. maybe if somebody I'd, doesn't want to know maybe just keep keep I'd, I'd, I'd agree with Darren though I think there is a spoiler culture thing where it gets a bit too much I but mean, I, I to think be, this be particular clear. is a different scenario like, for I me mean, yeah. I'm not I'm not raining on the idea like I'm not saying spoil everything or anything like that like I'm saying use common sense spoilers have always been an issue agreed and it's I, very much like it's a case we talked about this before where you go to Skyfall you get a little letter on your chair as a critic telling you not to spoil any plot points of the film and you watch the film and it's very clear which yeah. plot point you should not spoil I just use common sense yeah, to do that. The there, internet there, is, has there is an argument to be made, though, that if you're going to read, like if you're the type of person who's going to read a review of a film, you have to be accept that you're going to read a few things about it. I like agree. if you want to know absolutely nothing, then don't watch the trailer, don't read the, the reviews. Mute, oh, mute everything mute or just mute stay keywords, like yeah. mute extensively. Mute doesn't but still, always work, but yeah, yeah, yeah have images to, yeah, and stuff yeah, get yeah, past yeah. me. That so person who types just, that wars. Just unplug <laughs> from the internet, full stop. Like if you want to be really hardcore, that's what you need to do because. I mean, I it, don't like yeah. the idea of spoilers. I don't like anything being spoiled, but I would never read a review of a film before I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing of it you is, know? that's exactly it. it like, I'd read it You afterwards. know what the internet is now. We all know what the internet yeah. is now. Yeah. If you go online on a Monday and you want to watch Game of Thrones on a Monday evening... You stay off the, you stay off the social yeah. media and if you, don't, you don't go to news then sites and their entertainment People sections. will say stuff... The even harmless stuff. Yeah. The you sites will put headlines. What does such and such mean to... Nin, 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 yeah. 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 For mm-hmm. clickbait. And that's what you're going to read. Yeah. That's life, like yeah, yeah. So no, I, I and I agree entirely, and I'm sensitive to that, and I do think that it's it's just a matter of like common sense. Like I mean, again, you know, I think that it's a judgment that every person has to make. I just uh, I'm not entirely comfortable with the idea of it being sort of like dictated. I did. I, I mean, as like, I said, I think it's a it's a unique event in that regard yeah. over a 21 film series. Right. I will say that's slightly different right. in general terms because I don't think we'll yeah. see another universe ever in cinema. Like you wouldn't. Others have tried and it hasn't worked. Yeah. I mean, you're not rooting for DCU Mark II. That's dead, isn't it? No. Nobody cares. It, it's dead. They're just going to make individual it's weird not, films. It's never going to be the same no, on the same not. scale. Like, no. even if there are a lot of people who are very invested in it. And they, tried the un- they tried the horror the universal impact. thing and everything. The Conjuring thing is actually probably the closest thing yeah, but the, the MCU. Universal thing That's is true. So yeah, probably right. That's probably like the only the MCU is the most successful. Sorry, the, the MCU, the Conjuring universe is the second most successful yeah, but, shared but universe. But that's on its own little... Which is remarkable. But it's more spin-off-y than... Uh, yeah, than like crossover. Yeah. Although you do have the characters You mean, like, not the Quentin Tarantino shared universe? Which I'm kind of a fan of. Is that re- I know it's not. I love the idea that that I love the idea that they all took place yes, in the same not, universe. Though, yeah. And like in the world of Pulp Fiction, World War Two ended because two randomers broke into a movie yeah. theater and shot Hitler. I don't in the believe face. that's true. Though. And that's why true romance is about like trying to make the life story yeah. of the bear Jew, isn't it? I don't believe any of that. Jay. 
I'm Sometimes sorry, you I take your cynicism too I damn far. It's just, I just, I, I think it. <laughs> I don't think it makes an impact one way or the other. I, just I think, think Tarantino, Tarantino is about. this I idea think it's of an, a world. an enjoyable enhancement if you're into that kind of thing. I think thing. it's cool. yeah. it doesn't actually impact films yeah. in any way if you want to ignore it. Yeah. yeah. What I'm saying is, I think Tarantino had this idea, and I remember reading that years ago. This character is related to this character. I think every film comes out, people just just like, oh, well, this means this because this means this. It's like it's like uh, Nostradamus predictions. It's nonsense. <laughs> anyway, that's me. Nostradamus. Yeah. All right, your man. Anyway, your man. So, also in big news and sort of taking a bit of a swing both across the Atlantic Ocean and also into the world of art house cinema, Cannes, baby! Cannes is opening. Cannes, Cannes lineup has been announced. And it's, it's certainly a Cannes lineup. It is, yeah. The usual all are all there in Ken Loach is there. Well, they're going to have a 10-minute uh, silence for Notre Dame or something. Uh, Amadova's there. In fairness, it is an Agnes Varda poster, which is fab. It's a beautiful poster. So, um, you know. Congratulations on doing the bare minimum. I know, in fairness, <laughs> no, no, it's no, the no, first no. filmmaker ever to appear in a Cannes poster, and yeah. I think that's. It's that's worth cool. celebrating. And also, like, I mean, again. And we be were, Goddard to it, so that's didn't good. Photoshop yeah. high heels onto her. Well, they did Photoshop another woman out of the photo, but. There you uh, are. The thing yeah, but it is a Varda. It is a Varda thing. festival. Um, and the other person probably hasn't died. Yeah. Um, in fairness. <laughs> just, you know, these things matter. Like. That's it. And I mean, like, you, it back. in memoriam. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Wait until you pers- kick the book at Mrs. Yeah. And then we'll oh, give yeah. you a poster. Whoever you are. We'll Photoshop Varda out of that picture. <laughs> yeah. uh, It'll just be blank space and you in the background. But I mean, the, the thing with the uh, thing with that, though, is that, like, again, as much as Cannes is going to Cannes, uh, and it absolutely does. Um, I like, can't with Cannes. Yeah, I, oh, you can do it, Grace. You can do it. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it, it, despite the fact that Cannes is going to do the Cannes thing inevitably, like, even the little press conference had a really nice sort of It's little, so uh, weird. Blog. It's like two outflas. Uh, <laughs> one of them has taken his glass on and off to read stuff. They have a big fancy screen behind them that doesn't show up any titles yeah. because, you know, why would you do that? Yeah. For, for listeners who are watching for some people that might want to watch work. it but can't listen yeah. to it at work somebody yeah, wants to so get at work I didn't have my earphones because it's, it's like it. the couldn't French even auto-generate some captions you bastards yeah, right it's like the French Oscar noms basically it's, it's incredibly snooty but it's very French. highly impractical they should be smoking when they're doing it like they really <laughs> should reject jackets. all yeah. concepts of modernity I mean, whatsoever the lineup is it's okay I mean the whole is, thing is um, like Bong Joon-ho in there anywhere yes there is indeed Parasite is there isn't it yes Terrence Malick is there the Darlene is there there can land can loach. Nick the Swinding reference to Old to Die Young is there as well. Which episodes is four and five. Technically an Amazon TV show. Episodes four and five of it showing out of competition well, Netflix, as well. Ne- they're much kinder to Amazon than they are to Netflix. Oh yeah, because Amazon's, Amazon's well to play it's ball. Good, yeah. uh, Netflix won't the, adhere to the 36 month long uh, exclusive release They, they will break France eventually. They will. Oh yeah, no, no, they'll, they'll bring France to heel. Um, eventually. I mean, I mean, again, this is the argument where <laughs> There's so here's, many jokes. Here's, here's a, uh, what to call it, conspiracy theory for you. Netflix set fire to Notre Dame. Okay. Want to point Ooh. out for the record that that didn't happen. No, for, just to be clear. In for case Netflix knew. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I like it, Grace. I like that kind of weirdness. I thought, I thought. Well, it, is, it is interesting, though, because it does raise the question of, like, is Cannes still a launching pad for Oscar-nominated films these days? Like, I mean, are any of the films that premiere at Cannes going to be Best Picture contenders? When was the last time they were? I don't think, yeah, it's been a couple of years. What one last year? It's only uh, Venice. And it seems very removed to it my is. It's very early it kind of in the year. It's very early in the year. I don't yeah, think that's the issue, though. It's a problem. French thing. That you have with a lot of festivals where you know a bunch of people see them and then eight months later everyone else sees them. Or a year later with Cannes. Yeah, or two uh, years even, whatever. So it's, yeah, I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to look at it in that way because you're sort of feeling like, oh, that's still around? The I thought it was out like four years the ago. The traditional launch pad for Holly Oscars are Toronto and yeah. Venice. Venice now, yeah. it's not, but I think that's been well, for a while. Well, it makes more though. sense time-wise right. yeah. also. Yeah. I think can you can get an early breakout and one that might last the, the yeah. pace, but it's been, I think it's been a while. Um, I don't know. It, the thing, like, I mean, the whole thing again. People are focused on the many women are in the main four. directed four out of nineteen. Which Don, Don Clark made the point so. that whilst that's not great, in two thousand twelve there were none. Yep. Uh, and that's, and that's, that was, that's only seven years. Full thirty three percent, aka um, one. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> they're French and they're idiosyncratic and they do their own thing and it's can and it's weird and it's women whatever. just don't make movies, you guys. And modernity just creeps up on them. Yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll, I mean, they'll just die keep... eventually. And they'll, yeah, but they'll, they'll, yeah, but yeah, but it'll be the this same. Is, again, this is French film culture. It's like this is not going to change. Whatever about it, and there is something to be said that yeah. French film culture protects French film. Yes, absolutely. And whatever about it, there's a flourishing French film industry, and has continued for a long, long time. And they, and they have very, oh, they, as well, they like actually yeah. do. But they, they protect their film in terms of against Hollywood, in terms of against With a lot an of things. Iron and their culture, yeah, and, but they're, they're they're probably right to do it because if they, if you don't. 
it dies like because I mean it's an onslaught from the world like of everything like if you want something to exist and you see the problems Ireland has with getting their films out there like it's it's desperately difficult I, I mean like I, I would be more sympathetic to the idea that our film culture has come on quite a great deal no, I mean like I, mean, I, you... I know but it's yeah like how many Irish people watch Irish films and like French films and watching French films is ingrained in French it's culture, part of the culture yeah. and that's that takes a long long time to yeah. do and cultivate and that's and invest and all the rest yeah of it. but you're also talking about a very large market and a very large country but even like, disproportionately I, mean, I think they're 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 strong. Like it's 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 hard to compare that to somewhere like here where the market is much smaller. But even, but even, even your potential even, even audience. By percentage is much though, smaller. it's uh, it's like well, Irish a, Irish audiences uh, in particular, like compared to Europe, tend to see fewer Irish films compared to by per, and by per percentage Adam wise and, like and, yeah, and capita. Sorry, in Fra- but in, but in France though, I think it, it, it's quite high because the value. And they invest and they preserve and, and, preserve they, and yeah, do all the protect. things to make sure I protect it. I think that's a massive thing. Uh, it isn't, it isn't. I, it is in one way, but I, I absolutely like understand why. Because otherwise you just end up with Starbucks in every corner. This is the kind of argument of what do you want? Like Hollywood films come in and wash away all the French films I mean, or I what? Do, like, a, I mean, I think there's a mid ground. There is. Balance. And yeah. eventually Maybe France like will. Maybe like an 18 month window. France will at some point see the small amount of ground but they will never in no, opinion, no, see no, the again, full, this like, is a cultural thing. And, they, no, and, they, and it's part of like I mean we joke that's about what it's I kind of like about love, yeah, I mean I, Agnes Varda could make 50 something films in, yeah, in whatever years because French funding was available position, and then whatever about anything else yeah. that's important yeah and she wouldn't be washed away in the same way it's hard to imagine her getting that sort of freedom or opportunity in the Hollywood well if system. you compare some like an A May who made four yeah. there you go All screw right. Hollywood that's the, that's the question there I'm not quite as simple, no, no. but I mean, I, but I, I think that the, the point is there. Like, a and point I think there, and again, I just think that there is a middle ground to be found there, and I do think that yeah, that, Darren like, Middle Ground Mooney will like, find that what, spot. What can you say? <laughs> uh, I'm still in the center. It's just the rest of the world that's lurched to the right. Let's move on about the top Indeed. ten, ladies and gentlemen. So at number ten, it's Missing Link. This is yeah, bombed, hasn't it? This uh, is really depressing. Like it really needs to advertise its films better. I think might be it question yeah. that has to be asked at this point it does kind of look like a kinder egg that came to life it, like I, I saw the trailer and I told you it looked dreadful mm. you told me it looked good and I may or may not get to see it in fact I probably won't for this it's probably disappear this week but yeah. like it's a kid like kid films in Ireland it should be no brainer it should be in the cinema for 10 weeks oh yeah don't worry we're going to get another uh, couple of kids films before we go this is this is just warming this us is, up this is, and this is the best of them how is that argue, yeah. possible yeah. though how did he not I don't understand how, like, I do wonder if the stop motion's a thing. We had, like, I mean, you had the same thing with Ardman and the Early Man as well. Um, Ard- no, Ardman do okay generally. Yeah, right. Early Man was a. I, I would suspect the Early Man probably made a few quid as well, even yeah. if it's not very good. But like Ardman generally do pretty well. Right. I think it's more of a a marketing thing. Marketing. Like I think it is. Unfortunately, yeah. sadly. Alas, it's a shame because it it's is. really, really well, good. I'm looking forward to seeing it now because you, you did kind of sell it to me. Yeah, no worries. I'll link you up, Jay. Uh, at number nine, having earned 2.6 million euro at the Irish box office date, it's Captain Marvel. A marvellous haul indeed. Yes, uh, it's done well and it continues to do well. Well, 2.6 is pretty good. 2.6 uh, is great. It's, I have no idea in comparison to other Marvels. I presume Black Panther and all is bigger than that, has it? I believe so, yeah. But I mean, still, it's... No, no, no. And, no, and, and obviously Infinity film. War and Endgame will do better as well. But in terms but of like... leaving the cinema perfectly, actually. Next week, you guys. Anyway. Well, that's it, exactly. Again, yeah, same thing happened with Black it. Panther, yeah, yeah. Panther last year. Black Panther, I want to watch that film. Like Panther. Well, that's that's where the name comes from. I don't ruin it. That sounds like a... Joke, and then you've ruined the way you bring in reality into it. I was just that. sucking the wind right okay. out of the sail. Jesus, was... Stanley and Jack Kirby created that. Anyway, never mind. It doesn't matter. T- go take the pun. No, it's uh, anyway. too late now. You've ruined it. There was a there was a group of men in, in Second World War who were called. I can't the believe Black you're Panthers. stepping on his pun. Yeah, I guess so few of them. Like you have all of them. The puns betrayed him. Sorry, I'm such a punishing host. So I am. You see. This one I'm up against. At number eight, let's go whole hog and talk about Peppa Pig Festival of Fun. That's not. Uh, <laughs> is this the one where the, the was the horror trailer shown before or something happened? Oh, or something. Was, I love that when this. Happens. I love that. Me too. Actually, it makes me hysteric when they hear kids crying. Doesn't <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it? No, not. It doesn't you know scar the them. Are, I think with the a lot of those, they probably wouldn't even understand it. No, I don't. He'd just be like, all right. He opens up his little cup of coke and he just says, uh, "Children's tears out a nice bit." No, of flavor. like I'm not suggesting nice we acidic. should put martyrs on for them. What I'm saying is, a couple of trailers yeah. that age it appropriate as fun when yeah. you start crying. Oh, no, I don't mean, and I say that as, as a kid who it's watched horror movies. You're a Me monster. Yeah. Say this as a kid who loved horror movies. World's horror greatest movies. monster. World's greatest. I like that. Not biggest, <laughs> greatest. I'm the best. I could watch horror movies so much more easily when I was younger because I didn't read into them at all and I just sat there going, oh, Face value. Grand. Yeah. That's yeah. A, yeah. Now you're it's like, like, oh, no, no, the heads come off. Okay, grand. And then you grow up and you're like, this is nonsense. Like, you know, it just sucks all the joy out of it. Become cynical in your old age, Chris. Yeah. Speaking of sucking all the joy out of everything. 
At number seven, Hellboy. Nice, nice segue. I want to hear about this. Hit me with it, Darren. thousand euro Yeesh. at the Irish box office, which is so not it's great. notoriously terrible. It's pretty terrible. It's not, Ooh. but it's not like good terrible. It's like terrible, terrible. Like if Galmero del Toro's <laughs> Hellboy is the story of a teenager told by an adult who sees the world through the eyes of a child. She's then... just very confusing. Hang on a second, what? That's very Guillermo, though, isn't it? Yeah. Then Neil Marshall's Hellboy is the story of a teenager told by a teenager a bit who sees the world now, through. Well, it's, the argument is that's not really Neil Marshall's film. There's yeah, always, there's a lot, oh, huge amount of back behind the scenes. Almost stuff. as soon as the movie dropped, you started getting all of these like stories. stories yeah, planted finger from pointed. I love yeah. the story. Again, it's like Josh Trank's he didn't fan- actually direct this. Well, Josh Trank's Fantastic Forces situation, where you had these producers who were like, "Hey, hey, hey!" It's like you know. They're on set actually directing it and he's not. And the idea of who actually had final cut on the film and stuff like that. But even things like... It uh, wasn't Neil Marshall. Marshall yeah, Marshall didn't go to the premiere apparently. Yeah. So, the, so the story goes, which is... Uh, this bodes well. Yeah, it's it's not a good film. It's bad and it's bad in weird ways that are not interesting or fun, which is the worst part of it. It can't even be a noble failure. There are like big problems and there are small problems and they both become immediately clear like from the opening scene. The Oosh. small problems begin with a voiceover from Ian uh, Ian McShane, oh. who, as you may know, is like first of all very affordable, but second of all uh, is like one. He'll of do the, anything. He will do anything. Have you read his interview about doing Game of Thrones, where he finally got to do it? It's like I don't care if I spoil your tits and dragons. Yeah, but, <laughs> but not, not even that. Like that, that's great. He's not but only he, in like two episodes of Game of Thrones. Episode, not like, even that. He's in one episode. And he dies oh, at the end. Of it. One episode, and he dies at the end. But his interview giving it was great. It's like, oh. Brian's going to be so... Brian Cox turned down a role because they wouldn't pay him enough. You know Brian. Oh, he's going to be so jealous when they saw what they paid me. Um, <laughs> so, I love Ian well, I love McShane. Me too. Um, but anyway, so like Ian McShane is... You know, I mean, like, he's, he's not the most discerning of actors, but you can use him very well. And like, he has gravitas. Yeah, like Deadwood, Deadwood did. One of like, the greatest roles ever yeah, on TV. And, and John Wick, for example. Yeah, yeah. John Wick 3 coming out. And one of the things that McShane is great at is precision swearing, right? Yes. So the opening thing, the opening scene in the film has lots of him delivering lots of exposition about what's happening and lots of swearing. And you would think, well, this should be a good fit. But like the opening line is like 1525, also known as the Dark Ages for a fucking good reason. And it's like, okay. that's not how you structure that, that sentence. Well. If you want to put the fucking in there for good fucking reason. And the film sort of continues in that sort of way. I'm not, I've never seen this. Like, the bigger thing is that it's got this weird thing where it assumes that you care about Hellboy. Like, it assumes that as an audience, you are emotionally invested in Hellboy. Are we? And it's, were we? No. And it's what? like, it's heaping on the lore. Like, there's an early scene in which two proper. villains who are not seen, like, you can't even see their faces, <coughs> are conversing about how Hellboy has screwed them over and they're going to avenge themselves upon Hellboy. And you're like, why do I even care what's happening here? And it's like, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe the movie's like jumping in. Maybe we're not getting another superhero origin story because we had the Gilmore Del Toro version. But no, the movie gives you in the middle of the film a five minute Hellboy origin story, which is the same as the one that you saw in Gilmore Del Toro's version, except shot much worse and featuring an inexplicable cameo from Thomas Hayden Church as a pulp Nazi hunter who has exactly three lines, including Guten Nacht and Hail Hitler. Bam. Um, it's insane. <laughs> now I'm back on board. <laughs> this sounds like it could be something to stick on on Netflix six months Get drunk on with wine. It sounds like Camp Classic yeah, almost. Yeah, of absolutely. It just, it doesn't really work. Like again, Thomas Hayden Church as a pulp superhero who's like, oh, and by the way, Captain America was there, but he only has three lines and he's never mentioned again. And it's like, what the hell's going on here? And I mean, and you can tell that like the notes came in in post-production. So you have a lot of like, make it funny. And like David Harbour, which is weird because like David Harbour playing Hellboy is like, because you can't see his face, it's very like John Goodman's playing Hellboy because he has a very John Goodman voice. He does actually. Yeah, I get you. you So if you're not getting the actor, what do you get? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's that you can tell that Harbour seems to have been dragged back to the ADR booth with like at the point of a gun (laughs) and told to deliver one line. Give me a funny line. That's it, exactly. So there are lots of shots of Son of a bitch, Harbour. (laughs) Say it. Say the line. (laughs) Like there's a lot of shots of him like holding pictures and the camera sort of pans over it and it's meant to be an emotional moment because it's like, well, look, this is Hellboy and his father. And it's like... Mr. Hellboy. The camera pans over and you have David Harbour saying in the most disinterested voice, Oh, so I'm not only a demon, I'm a Nazi too. Thanks, Dad. Or like a moment later where he smashes his phone, which is the joke. 
But because somebody in ADR was like, punch it up and make it funnier, he smashes the phone and he says, oh, crap. As if somebody's like, he's only just heard the words, oh, crap, for the first time when he's recording voiceover. It's Maybe it, it was his reaction to whatever line he was actually asked to say. Or when he was reading the script. Yeah. It, That's just really unfortunate. I quite like David Harbour. And I mean, that, me too. And because the plot is so exposition based, like there's a moment, there's a moment where, like, one of the characters is like shot in the neck by an evil demon and is going to die, right? I hate that. And some one of the witches who's hanging around is like, "Hey, you know what you should do? I can't cure her, but there is one person who can." Merlin. Hang on, what? Quicker than quicker than I said the sentence. There is one person who can cure her. Merlin. The cast have disappeared into another scene where Brian Gleason doing his best impression of his dad, plays a resurrected Merlin who shows up to heal the wounds, ah, would you deliver stop? exposition, <laughs> and then fade to dust in like long and shorter than it's taken me to describe this. Brian, it's, why? It's, I'm leaving the studio and going to see this an, right now. Do you think it's an asset or a disadvantage to Brian that he looks so much like his dad? Uh, like Donald didn't have this problem. Well, no, no he's, he he's buried under, like, because he's wearing the full Merlin beard, but he's going full Irish. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, oh, for God's I, sake, no. It was only like, it was like, did they get Brendan Gleeson to do this? Was this really the best you could do outside of Orsi? <laughs> yeah. Come on. This is remarkable. It's, yeah, and it's not That's even, grim. like, good. It's just terrible. And again, it's got all this stuff going on there with the, the teenage stuff and Hellboy having tantrums and all the stereotypical, like, oh, what if monsters and humans could I'm coexist? I'm a teenager, and... man. I've got problems. I'm so angsty. And it just, it's a disaster. Which is a shame because it's Neil Marshall. And while Marshall doesn't always make good films, he generally makes interesting films. They tend to be graphic. They tend to be aggressive. This feels like it's been neutered and cut to within an inch of its life. And it's really, really disappointing right. and heartbreaking for that. What was the point? Yep. That is the question indeed. At number six, it's Little, Little, which we talked about earlier, and it's I quite enjoyed actually. It's not necessarily a good film. It's certainly not a great film, but it's uh, enjoyable. Hits all of its beats and features a number of great performances. It's also got a great sense of well, it hasn't got a great sense of humor, but it's got a sense of charm <laughs> that carries it through some of the uh, you know not particularly funny all sequences right. as well. So I mean, you could certainly do a lot worse if you're going to go see a. And uh, you could see Hellboy. So yeah, <laughs> you, you could certainly can do a lot worse. Um, at number five, having earned two hundred ninety-two thousand euro at the Irish box office date, it's Pet Cemetery. Oh, which Pet myself Cemetery. and Grace have seen. I almost forgot that this was still out. I know it only just came out, but in my head, it's like, this is like what we were talking about. You know, when it <laughs> feels like later. a yeah. week feels like a decade has gone yeah. by, I'm like, is that still out? Was not that so not last year or possibly yeah. the year before? Um, yeah. Not sure, look, it's, it's, it seemed like it would be crowd-pleasing enough. Oh, and it certainly has. I mean, like, again, horror movies tend to play quite well, like uh, like it comedies. just generic enough, I think, to play well. 280,000, is that what you said? 292,000 Sounds like a lot is, uh, That's quite reasonable For the Irish box Keep in mind that like Captain Marvel is like 2.6 million No no million, just I, I don't know What they'd expect from this What's the sort of it. scale Well I mean Little is at 68,000 69,000 No in terms of uh, Kind of standard horror Kind of stuff What so, did us make In that uh, context That's us I think made no, about a million. Oh, oh That's what I mean and yeah. I don't know how It'd be comparable Alright At number 4 And doing surprisingly well Is Wild Rose uh, People do like A Star is Born story Yeah I missed that diff Because I was tired now, so, you sent uh, uh, Alex in your place. I sent that and he didn't like it, so sorry, yeah. Alex. <laughs> right. uh, the trailer is quite cringe. I'm sure the film's better, but I've just I've seen. I feel like I saw the trailer about four times or something in a row. You when I went like to cinema the every single time, I was just like, you just "It is like a bit that. weird." There's a really great article on the Ringer about why there are so many *A Star Is Born* narratives now, like, for, and not and not just because of the success of *A Star Is Born*, because obviously things like *Box Lost*. Can't wait Lost, for the Ted like Bundy this. one next month. Am I oh, right? Yep, yeah, that's on Sky, isn't it? That's coming to Netflix. Yes. Netflix, Netflix. Netflix. Oh, okay. On the third of May. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I'm requesting a screener of that one. That's going to be something to behold. Oh, yeah. Isn't it? Zephyron is Bundy, who's prepared. As a sort of, no as, a, as like, looks like a weird broad comedy. Yeah, the trailer was very strange. Yeah. If you could, if you know what you're doing, you can get away with that. Yeah. I'm not. Like, that was sort of a knowing tell. commentary on how he was just this all-American everyman that nobody would have expected to be a brutal serial killer. Maybe. Do we think the film will go down that route? When I read the book of the, the crime writer, who was his friend. Uh, there's a killer beside me I think it's called uh, I can't oh. remember the writer's name she's famous because he's also my friend Dahmer as well yeah but she's, oh, this is, this she's is a famous Bundy. writer who was uh, she became a famous writer she was a journalist she worked with him on some charity thing oh, and well. became a friend of his and then he wrote to her from prison and everything and she took a long time to uh, Jesus, could you imagine oh, God, what the hell is her name uh, but it, it's a really odd story about uh, 
Well, Bundy's a, a weird character, obviously, yeah. one might yeah. expect, given that he's a miracle, but his relationship between fame and particularly the relationship that you know exists in the United States between... Stranger Beside Me by Anne Rule, who's oh. a kind of a crime writer, and uh, she wrote about it, and the book is bizarre. As Let's one see. might imagine. Well, I mean, he turned his case into a public spectacle. Yeah, um, he did. And escaped and, I mean, a couple of times. And, and even, even since, like, the games that he played with the press and stuff like that. I mean, there's a tendency to romanticise him. You absolutely shouldn't. I mean, he was a sociopath and a psychopath. And maybe he and wasn't as clever if as, you like, find it, uh, If you read, and I did read the descriptions yeah. of the things he actually he did, did uh-huh. is absolutely it, horrible. I read, like, three paragraphs of the Wikipedia page when I was trying to decide whether to watch the Bondi tapes yeah, or whatever it was called on Netflix. Yeah. And I was like, no, I think yeah. I can live without that in my life. The book is pretty descriptive of what happened that it's grim. Yeah. No. Um, I will stick to uh, weird murders where people say it was aliens. You know, all with that. Yep. I fear that this may not raise the tone of the conversation. Wonder Park is at number three. Oh God! Yeah, let's skip What's that. This? Wonder yeah, Park is the, the animation. Directorless uh, animation. They've no director because uh, he may or may not have been involved in some sort of sexual harassment claims. Yeah, so they took him off the film. But what's the film about? Uh, it's about an animated... It's a boy is given the ability to become... No, never mind. That's not the description at all. The description... I don't actually have a description. It's a, a description. basically there's this park for animals. A kind of, yeah. The, yeah, it's kind of... And it's to set up it a TV terrible. show or something like that. Yeah. Like, the reason why it was pushed out and not buried is because it exists to set up this whole multimedia thing Cynical, that Paramount is pushing. Cynical uh, kind of nature, yeah. yeah. Poor Paramount. But it's going to die in its arse. Paramount can't really, catch me. You really almost feel sorry for Paramount. They don't even have point. a Mission Impossible this year. They've got two coming out, though. One next year and one the year after. Right, I, say la- I said last week, it's like, hire women directors, then you won't sexually harass people. That's a pretty good that policy. Know of. Yeah. yeah, in general terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Definitely Paramount. much statistically Studios much less likely. Studios are struggling should probably do that. Maybe as a safety thing. Yeah. Just, you know. well, I mean, just in general. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yes, indeed. You know. um, at number two, Shazam. Shazam. Which I saw again last night. Uh, I have Shazam. Shazam. <laughs> I was going to do it. You Shazam. have Shazam? I have not uh, Shazam happened. <laughs> I have Shazam. Wow, this is uh, oh, Shazam oh, myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All over the place. Unfortunately, Shazam uh, is not a superhero whose power is Shazam. to identify whatever music's playing in the room he's standing. Uh, but yeah, so I saw Shazam again last night, uh, and uh, I stand by my initial assessment. The first two acts are, are really, really good. The final act is very superhero, overdrawn, CGI, sort of overcomplicated, driven by lore stuff that kind of detracts from a lot of the charm of the other stuff. But it, it's generally quite good. It's very charming. It's very disarming. It's got this sort of like early pre-Marvel almost sort of like superhero thing where it's like nobody knows who like Mark Strong's Thaddeus Savannah is so let's just uh, yeah so let's just have a bit of fun with that um, and it kind of works well enough is there and a clue in the name no sorry I, I actually don't know genuinely I have no oh, idea no, no 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 he's, he's, he's a Captain Marvel villain but nobody's heard of him Okay, I know. He doesn't. He doesn't okay. like, like, I so, thought it was some sort of. So you can completely reinvent him again. This is the thing where it's like you you have the stuff in modern comic book movies where there's this emphasis on like textual fidelity and stuff like that, or copying. Mm. Like again, you have things like say the Daredevil TV show, which copied like panel from panel from like the Frank Miller work and stuff like that is like overly slavish in certain extents. It can work sometimes, in other cases it can't because adaptation okay. is an adaptation. But Shazam kind of works because it takes this very broad view of what the okay. character is and, and kind of has a bit of fun with it. And again, it's big, but with a superhero and. It's helped by a set of sort of winning performances, which I, I really, really enjoyed. Fair enough. And finally, at number one, it's Dumbo, which yes. I saw. And? As part of a double bill with Hellboy. God, what a day you had. <laughs> and this was the better film by far, okay. unsurprisingly. Um, Doesn't seem like there was much to uh, challenge it, though. No, no. Um, Dumbo is... I liked it. It's okay. Uh, which is, again, ringing endorsement from Darren here. Uh, it suffers from a number of problems, but obviously it's far too long. The opening 40 minutes could probably be cut and trimmed. They're the 40 minutes that get to the point where the elephant flies, because once the elephant starts flying, you can actually tell the story the film wants to tell. Uh, It also suffers a bit from the problem of a lot of these sort of Disney films where it's more invested in the children than the audience will. Like, if you're buying a ticket to Dumbo, you want to see an adorable elephant, right? Why do you care about precocious kids? That's also a point. But hey. Yeah, I take the point accepting these issues and the fact that again it is sort of like it's a late stage Burton film yeah. and it's it's got like it's gotten all the dynamism that made his earlier stuff particularly good three things in its defense very quickly first of all Batman Returns reunion I mean yeah. come on Danny DeVito head of a circus Michael Keaton is a centric billionaire who wants to destroy that circus but did he use, does he use them or waste them though um like are they, yeah, is well, it worth I mean, the admission in that regard no it's, it's not necessarily I mean again I think that Keaton does some interesting stuff particularly playing Walt Disney which we'll get to the second point there Keaton is very much again you can tell you can imagine that when this was written 
Burton was like, hey, I wonder if Johnny's free. And then he was like, no. no. He is never free <laughs> never ever free again. again. Uh, but yeah, so basically Keaton steps in to play this sort of Disney character and he does it in a way that's interesting because it's different from the way that Depp would do it. Yeah. So it's not a rehash of Willy Wonka or anything like that. Thank so it gets God. kind of, yeah, it gets kind of interesting in that respect and you have Elfman again. And again, like, I don't blame Elfman for this, but a lot of Elfman's scores recently are very bland and yeah, generic. Okay. And he's talked a bit to the Hollywood Reporter about like how a lot of that is down to the fact the direction he's given with temp tracks, where he's told to make his music sound like this other music. And while... That sounds a bit grim. It, it is very grim. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, Can you sound like this generic piece of trash we've just stuck on the end of the yeah, thing? Yeah, we, well, yeah, you're paying me like 10 million, sure, to make I it sound... Guess. I can plink plunk something I about 10 minutes. I'll swallow then, my pride. And then go back to my Malibu mansion and yeah. sla- laugh at your behind your back. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, not right, behind so. your back, in the Hollywood Reporter. Um, you. But yeah, but I mean, and again, so like it doesn't really pop in that sense, but there are moments where it kind of works in that respect and it's kind of good to see. Also, second point, this is a movie where Eva Green rides an elephant that Colin Farrell repeatedly calls Big D. I'm just going to leave that out can there we, and let you process that. Can we move on that. immediately? Good Lord. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, number three, um, it is... There's some interesting stuff sort of happening there in terms of the film's relationship with Disney. Again, I don't know how intentional this is, and it's certainly not as overt as it should be, but it's very much like it arrived at a time where Disney has bought Fox, where Disney's already earned the money back from Star Wars, where Disney is like populating the landscape. It's a behemoth that stole everything. Yes, that's it, exactly. And so you have this idea of like this traveling circus that is bought by the Emperor of Enchantment. Ah, right. The Columbus of Coney Island, who wants to own everything. The corporate monolith. Yes, who wants to bring it all together under his roof. And it's very clearly Dreamland is very clearly Disneyland, um, to the point where it even has things like the World of Tomorrow. Remember that those sort of Disneyland exhibits? And this idea of the very standardised, safe... But Disney could probably get away with it because they own everything. Well, that's exactly... they they, they even know potshots themselves, so who cares they won? Like, Disney own everything, even criticism of Disney. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't Um, matter. They can slag it off if you want to be another film next week you're going to pay for it. That's, that's exactly and I mean even when you're doing this like people are talking about how this is a bust and a failure it's not it's made 300 million it's worldwide people aren't talking about it it's one stupid Guardian article okay. that they always write that's fair Sorry, uh, but again it's made 300 million dollars worldwide okay okay it's made 300 million dollars worldwide yeah. but again there's this sense of if it doesn't make a billion in the first week it's a failure yeah that's it exactly but I mean yeah. and again it's kind of interesting to see that sort of owned by a Disney film and you wonder again how it's very gentle. It's not particularly like biting or wry or aggressive. Like it's certainly not, you know, none of the stuff that's actually a problem with Walt Disney as a person is explored in there. But you do have this idea of ownership that comes in and this idea of like consuming everything. And, okay. and it's kind of fascinating. And I kind of, I like that aspect of it. And then sort of finally Dumbo benefits because like Pete's Dragon, and I know you're not as big a fan of Pete's Dragon. I like Pete's Dragon. It's it's best Dave Lowry film there is out there, <laughs> which is say what you want about Never that. miss an opportunity. But think about like <laughs> think about Pete's Dragon and why Pete's Dragon is probably the best live action adapt- live action for the adaptation of a Disney film is because it's the w- it's one of the ones where there's actually freedom to do something with it. Well, yeah. Like, sorry, can I just say? And I don't know. I didn't want to. But is Pete's Dragon one of the Disney films in that way? In the way these are, because my sense is that was almost incidental. Yeah. It, to some degree and it looks it certainly doesn't look like the budget that the rest of them would have so, to some degree well this is this is the thing where again like you, you look sorry at did I action, preempt your point sorry you did preempt my point no 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 not at all but like you are you're entirely correct you look at things like say Beauty and the Beast which is almost a shot for shot remake of the animated show of the animated movie with 40 minutes yeah. extra added in that nobody and asked for hundred million to spend yeah. on it you look at things like say the Aladdin remake that's coming up or the Lion King remake <laughs> the Aladdin it's, remake <laughs> it's shot sorry, for sorry. shot but you look at things like the yeah. Lion King trailer oh, yeah. which is shot for which shot is from the animated thing and and again, that's what they're doing. They're sort of like they're, oh, they're no. updating them rather than they're not even adapting them. To they're a not even extent. updating them though. They're just yeah. taking some CGI and slapping the digitized it. Digitized the for kids. Yeah, that's it exactly. And it's just that, you know this is for the crowd who like to you know swipe instead of turning a page. But that's the thing is that like Dumbo, Jeez, Dumbo at least has the luxury of like being a story that again. Benefits is a strong word, but isn't reduced by this because Dumbo, by its nature, first of all, the 1940s film is only 60 minutes long. Um, and, and problematic. And yeah, okay, I was going to get to that. Yeah. yeah. There, Jim Crow does not recur. In no, this but I wouldn't have thought so. Yeah. Which is good. And you can start, like, there is something very cynical in that. You can tell that Disney is, like, protecting its investment and purging its That's uh, exactly history. purging its history in that sense. Yeah. And again, like, the animated. But they're trying to do it to some degree. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, it's, it's not like they're different deleting every copy of no. Dumbo. It like, exists. Was, yeah. Yeah. But they can say, well, we probably made a mistake here. Yeah. We can probably say, you know what? We done goofed. It was literally 1940. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we get a break on that one. Um, and again, like, there are moments in this that work. 
work. Again, the precocious kids aren't as interesting as the film thinks it is. And Burton, to be fair, kids are rarely, him, if ever, interesting. isn't as interested in real. them um, as anybody else's. But there are some wonderful shots with the Dumbo itself, which is very uncanny. The CGI is, for a Disney film, surprisingly like uncanny and rough in places. Mm. But because it's a Burton film, it feels almost stylized. And it's weird, it's not when the camera is looking at Dumbo that the film really works. It's the moment when the camera is looking at Dumbo, looking at something else, where the film almost becomes like magical. Okay. Where you have these moments where like the pink elephants moment from the original Dumbo, to pick an example, gets an homage. But that homage is the camera facing Dumbo with the corner of the elephant's mouth and its eye reflecting the image back. Okay. And a little curling of a grin, which is like the most affecting moment in the entire film. Now, you can treat that as a, as a condemnation of film and to a certain extent it probably is but I mean I didn't dislike this and in fact I liked it a great deal more than I expected to alright All right, so let's move on to the new releases yay an interesting week I think because myself and Jay have seen roughly the same amount of them for the love of when is this ever going to happen again there so we should probably get this out of the way right now I don't know what you mean there dragged across concrete mm. the surprise film at this year's uh Dublin International Film Festival was it? Media, went Dublin. down a storm as we all know yep um, yeah this out this week uh, went down a storm and drummed anyway this is pretty terrible um, this is like I, we, I talked about this a little bit when they when we were kind of doing a festival roundup when we were when, uh, after our diff um, we myself <laughs> myself and I and Darren were sitting in the cinema before we started and I made a joke. So you, geez, imagine it was dragged across concrete, and, and now it's already says, There's no way that'd be because that'd be two hours and forty. They wouldn't put that in the window like that. And then the film started. It's like, oh, ah, Jesus, <laughs> ah, Jesus. Oh, it is that. And in this so sense, you have not experienced a film until you've experienced it sitting beside Jay. You really haven't. Um, I there is a couple of like there's two or three things here, right? That it's worth getting out of the way in in the first context, right? I am not the biggest Mel Gibson fan for <coughs> for obvious reasons, right? There's a good argument in the way that Mel Gibson hasn't really done as mea culpas in, in any <laughs> it's a, real it's sense. a good argument. But I mean, in the, in the, what I mean is, like, clearly he hasn't. Yeah. But what I mean is, in the Hollywood context even of how they allow people allowing back that, in yeah. and whatever, yeah. he is kind of mealy-mouthed his way back in yeah. without really saying anything. Yeah. And that's a problem, right? Yeah. So you said that's another thing. I'm, so I generally wouldn't be kind of wild to see a new Mel Gibson film in general terms, right? That's fine. Understandably that, so. Like, so yeah, you're at the, but I'm at the film. He's in it. So yeah. be it, right? Yeah. The other thing is, walk out, Jay? yes, indeed. Uh, the other thing is, uh, Craig S. Saller, who's the director, has made this is the third film. Uh, the first one was Bone Tomahawk. Bone Tomahawk, which is fascinating, occasionally brilliant, and definitely over long piece of genre. It's really fascinating. Loved it. It was I my did, I, favorite film of the I year. I didn't love it, but I liked huge parts of it yeah. at various times, and I really liked the elements that yeah. I liked. Yeah. But I, I did think it was far too long. And I'm dreading going back to it. But anyway, I can imagine. I uh, and then I saw Broad Cycle, Cell Block 99, which is not very good at all. No. And excruciating in some ways. Uh, I'm somewhat so, warmer on it than you are, but not yeah. particularly uh, excited. So I I'm, I'm not wasn't particularly excited by a new Craig S. Aller film. Or S. Craig S. Aller, sorry. Or S. Craig Aller, what his name is. Um, <laughs> but anyway, you know, open mind and all that, Darren. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. That was a sarcastic open mind. But... Right, so they're over there, right? Yeah, and, and now, you're, you're probably going to leave now. There's one point, right? In the film, there's a thing with Salar that he is, and it's been referenced and in reviews and various things that's been written, that he's a kind of the new provocateur in cinema in the way that he will say and write things that people aren't allowed or aren't supposed to say or write anymore, right? Yeah. That, that's fine, right? The cinema needs that to a certain yeah. degree. Cinema needs people to write stuff. To shake that, things up. To shake things up. And it, that's um, an it's important role, yeah. right? And there, like, the, but there is an argument, and I think that this film would certainly wouldn't put it into this argument that Zahler might well believe the stuff at this stage that he's right. There's a certain point after three films that this might be his thesis as opposed to his character saying these things. But, he, but even if it's not the case, that's fine, right? Okay. I was going to say what... what and keep in mind that I like this more than both you and Niall. Yes, the, I also, there's a, there's a I also scene didn't the, like it at all. There's a police station scene <laughs> where Don Johnson is the police captain, Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn, who were the police partners. Officer, question, yeah. uh, Mel Gibson was the partner of Don Johnson. He Don Johnson learned to play by the rules and got promoted. Mel Gibson 
was basically Almost Mel Gibson. Almost as if it's a metaphor yeah, for something. Right? And they have this whole conversation about, you know, how social media has changed things. Now you can't see anything these days. And Without so being recorded and yeah, having it broadcast. Yeah. While the camera focuses on Mel Gibson's face. Yeah. All of this. I, I wonder what, what the film could possibly be yeah, saying. Provocative right? and all that, right? And you can argue as to whether Zoller saying this is what he means or this is the character saying yeah. what he means, whatever. None of that. All well, I of mean, that, the character doesn't know he's talking to Mel Gibson, no. but anyway. Well, I take, well, yeah, indeed. All of that is an of it. Like, various different arguments people have about this film and all are valid within the context yeah. of how the film operates and exists in right fine even if you can accept all that fine what is the film doing and this is where the problem is really being for me this is never ending extraordinary dull for a story that's set up that is set up in a, as a kind of quasi heat for want of a better word where this Mel Gibson and uh What's his face? Vin Vaughn are playing two cops who get into trouble for doing something at the start of the film in a kind of a, a stakeout slash uh, arrest that goes awry. Yeah. And then there's there's a guy that gets out of prison played by and I'll have to look him up. Uh, who gets out of prison and he he has a younger brother who's in the wheelchair and a mother who's struggling. So he decides to a friend of his to get into a, get involved a in police corps. Yeah. It's a Tory Kittles is the name of the guy. Yes. And so and Michael J. White is his friend. And they decide to get involved in these kind of European, I think, criminals to do this kind of robbery. That's the yeah. setup. So it's this quasi heat bad guys uh, trying to go from criminals to good and then cops who are cops maybe going towards criminal behavior. Yeah. So it has this kind of opposite thing. Again, structurally, I have no real issue with that. It, it makes absolute sense yeah. in a lot of it's, ways. It's, it's, it's been done before. It's, it's a standard done. formula for this. So. But there's, there's extraordinarily overwritten dialogue that never, never, never stops. There's mediocre acting, dull, long, never-ending scenes, flatly directed, playing in a kind of heightened dialogue like a James Elroy kind of thing without really putting the work in to make it sound good or interesting, and goes on for days (laughs) without anything of interest happening. I'd like... I was nearly in tears by the end of it. It's like... You can have all the reactionary politics, blah, 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 blah. You want your Mel Gibson's record. How can you make a film so dull? I, 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 it's staggering to me how a film is this dull. I, like, over two hours and 40 minutes. I What's that Tarkovsky quote about how you approach boredom and you reach boredom? Then you move past boredom into something that's like a pure sort of interest. I think that's what the film was going for. Yeah, it didn't. It, there are it, lots of shots it, of roads. It drowns very quickly in boredom and uh, never, I hate it. I, I absolutely hate it. I really did not care for this at all. What's interesting, though, is that, like... And it's interesting that you talk about your reactionary politics and your position, your provocateur and stuff like that. I don't mind being provocative, and I don't mind me being either. controversial, but the the issue for me with Drive to Cross Concrete is that it never feels like it's doing any of this for any greater end no. other than just being provocative. Yeah. Uh, which is, is the thing. Like, it feels like it doesn't have anything that it's actually saying about... Like, that sequence with Don Johnson and Mel Gibson... What is it actually saying about Mel Gibson? Is it like, is it that, hey, he did... Exonerate him, he's paid yeah, his dues. Yeah, what, 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 what are you yeah, That's here? exactly it. And I mean, there's, there's a scene early on where a woman is stripped down, thrown in a shower, it's and naked, and held, scene, actually. held under an air conditioner, yeah. as if Saller's like forcing you as the audience to say, hey, look at how gratuitous this violence I'm committing against a woman is. There's another sequence later on with Jennifer Carpenter, which oh, is, that's... like, again, and again, I, like, I understand... I like Jennifer Carpenter, I have I... to say, as an actress. I understand narratively what he's doing there, but it's, again, it's it's something that exists primarily so he is a director and go, ha, look at you audience, look at what I'm doing. Look, I can, I can kill anyone any time, I can do anything. Okay, well, I wasn't going to say it, but yes, yeah. it's, it, that's very much how it exists. But I mean, it's a scene that could be excised to make the film shorter. If it, or if you tightened, want. or like that sort of stuff. The whole point of it is, though, is that Zeller is like treating himself as, and again, this is indulgence, and I generally yeah, it, don't mind indulgence. It's like... If you've got the skills to back it up, yeah. I'm absolutely fine with that. Yeah. This, on the other hand, feels like it's like... I'm going to take forever to say something that I'm not even sure what exactly I'm articulating. I've got two hours and 40 minutes here yeah. and I'm going to show you how filmmakers used to be in the old days. But without understanding I'm John Ford. Being... I'm Samuel Fuller. Peckabod. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean... Like... Bog, like, if you ever see The Wild Bunch, yeah. The Wild Bunch is a fascinating film because it's A, it's my favourite western of all time, right? Yeah. But it has this kind of end of an era kind of uh, feel and it has William Holden playing against type as this yeah. kind of absolute maniac but the whole violence is against there's various different things there's Vietnam yeah. in it there's that kind of 
reactionary listen we can just end all this kind yeah. of stuff the, in America at the time yeah. it was saying something about the state of the country yeah. and how people reacted and end of eras and how you keep pushing west and you keep yeah. until you hit the end and it's brutal and it's brilliant and it's nasty yeah. and it's horrible yeah. but, but it's, it's actually br- saying br- something but it's saying it's, like it's, it, it, there's a reason for it to exist beyond it's not yeah. doing violence for violence sake and I mean, like, I don't even mind violence for violence sake. But two hours and 40 minutes of violence but I don't, like, violence I don't need, a, I don't like, need a lesson yeah, with it. Like, yeah. if you're going to be violent, do a, a Tarantino homage or whatever and, you know, act a maggot for two hours. Or, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, like, you're either good or serious or doing something yeah. real or you're not. No, that's it. And again, like, you, you point to Elroy. For me, the, the point here is Tarantino, who, yeah. who makes movies of a similar length but never drag like this does. I mean, I actually agree with that, um, and I I've had I mean, many I issues with certain Tarantino films. Tarantino. I know. I, I, like Glorious Bastards aside, which I adore, yeah. but I, I I agree. But like whatever about Tarantino, he's generally aware of what he's doing yeah. and why he's doing it. You could disagree or think it's too long or too absurd. Like yeah. he's making his films unapologetically, but he knows why he's doing yes. it, and he makes he articulates why he's yes. doing it quite clearly. Yeah. This, on I the mean, other hand, is doing something because it can yeah. and because it knows it wants to get a reaction, which is a yeah. It's a child's tantrum, which is, and it's a child's tantrum for the last two hours and forty minutes. It's very like. It's and what I find fascinating about, say, *Inglorious Bastards*, like, for a, just as an example, is like Tarantino fanboys to the point that cinema kills Hitler, which is really fascinating. Yeah. In many many ways, there's many ways to read it. Yeah. And like, you can laugh at it and find it juvenile, and that's all fine. I find it juvenile, like, find it insulting, find it crass, find it vulgar. But it's ex- but it, extraordinarily funny and cathartic in a yeah. weird sort of way. Like, but it's a statement, yeah, and it's it saying is. something, and it's yes. doing something, yeah. and this isn't. No, at all. And I mean that that's the thing for, about it is for hours and days. I feels, think I'm still there in the cinema. There's part of me still there never left that watching cinema Dragon watching Rose it. Book. Yeah, there's there's that's that's my issue with it. Is I that I hated I don't, the darn I fucking hated it. I found interesting bits in it, but it was just You're a, a better a, man than I am. At a certain point it just became it, And I really don't want to watch a Mel Gibson film ever again. And again if I can help it. Like this is the point where like we've reached a point where I'm describing a film in terms that are probably more yourself and Grace would use where it disappeared up its own hole. Yeah. And I was like, hey, <laughs> that does sound like a great term. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where is it? Where's the torch? It doesn't even have a torch at a certain yeah. point. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's silly. It's very which silly. is a shame because I mean, like again, I liked Zoller's first film, and I do wonder, like, when I go back, how I'd be afraid. I would exactly think I, I would be worried. And I've had films where I've gone the other way. Say after watching the Bling Ring, where I think maybe I need to go back and watch some Sophie Paul more because it might have turned yeah. me around. Now I've, I've gone the other way with this, and it's like. Maybe I overrated <laughs> Bone Tomahawk a little more than I thought it would, you know. Yeah. And there's films that have the effect that can actually turn you around the matter. Well, it's, it's good or when, bad. Like. when you it's the moment of realizing that the person you thought was saying something was not saying anything at it's all. Where, where you yeah. realize that again, yeah. and uh, you try to be generous. Again, we talked about this with class. Where it's like you're as a critic, my default position is one of generosity. I assume the director knows what he's doing. Or you can certainly hope so. Yeah, um, and my fear, having watched Drive to Goss Concrete, is that I'll go back to Bone Tomahawk and it'll be. Hey, turns out that all the good faith I gave it was not necessarily there. Yeah. It wasn't saying all the interesting stuff that I But let me know because I have no real desire to go back. But <laughs> if you do go back, let me know because I'm curious. Okay, slight release in terms of new releases, which is strange because this is a four day weekend. Headful of Honey, directed by Till Schweiger, is out. Uh, I have no idea what this is for. This is a man suffering from Alzheimer's embarks on a final road trip with his great grand- well, sorry, with his granddaughter, starring uh, Nick Nolte, uh, oh. Claire Forlani. I like yeah. Claire Forlani. Emily, uh, Emily Mortimer, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Emily Morty, one of Emily the greats. Morty. And <laughs> Eric Roberts. Jesus. That just what a cryogenically unfrozen Eric Roberts. Oh, Eric Roberts been in Sharknado movies. I know, I as love well, it. As well. Has he? Yeah. I saw the Sharknado the one set in, I saw the last 10 minutes of the Sharknado one set in London. Yeah. Wow, well, that's a thing. That's it's, one of the worst things I've ever seen. As far as like, Os- did he win an Oscar or was he just nominated for Money Train? But like, as far as Oscar, like he makes Cuba Gooding Jr. Like Cuba Gooding Jr. aspires towards the very, being Eric The Roberts. very late Larry Cohn made a wonderful wonderful film in I think 1990 with Eric Roberts called The Ambulance and is well worth seeking out it's creepy Eric, and weird and really good Roberts can be great when he's used and when you have a director who can and he had him, to, like, he's got some good time in the 80s 90s early yeah. 90s like. I mean even, even he popped up in Batman didn't he? he did he popped up in The Dark Knight he's yeah. used exceptionally well in The Dark Knight yeah, because is, it's yeah. basically like hey it's, lowest yeah. price Al Pacino yeah let let's, us get the I'll t- let's drop him from the <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um, true yeah it's very true and then Laura which I also saw at yes, this, this is, is turning the, out to be quite the Vim Diff week it turns out yeah and you saw this is the Paulo Sorrentino film about Silvio I uh, Silvio Berlusconi. I saw this with Alex, and it's I. Jesus. I like this with the caveat that I also liked Vice. So hey, who knows how Darren's opinion of Paul I'm afraid, is but uh, but I did like uh, Il Divo from Sorrentino, which is the same actor, Paul Sorrentino, who plays uh, 
Silvio on this. I haven't, seen, I haven't seen El Divo. El Divo's very good. But uh, I, I heartily recommend it. I would warn you that Alex cautioned that this is not that by any stretch of the imagination. I it's wouldn't have thought specific so. specific and very broad. Yeah, that's what and I heard. That's what I like about it. It's this very much this allegory about like identity, power, uh, and sort of like personhood and trying yeah. to find purpose and this idea of corruption as it flows the rotting head of the fish and this allegory for just this sort of like impotence uh, it's it's very much it's a midlife crisis movie to a certain extent which makes a great deal of sense when you're dealing with somebody like Silvio Berlusconi where yes. he's presented as this almost, permanent midlife crisis that's it exactly whose midlife crisis encompasses an entire sort of country yes there's a nice recurring joke throughout the film about him promising to set off the volcano on his gigantic <laughs> mansion that just never <laughs> arrives uh, which is just phenomenal and it's really good I like this a lot it's very much it's a film it was edited down from two films yeah uh, it, was, it was released as two films in Italy I think. in Italy as well uh, and it was sort of cut down you can kind of see that and it feels like the first half maybe gets a bit of a short trip I suspect you might see the two parts rocking up somewhere maybe Netflix or somewhere like that yeah and then they'll see the full they like the Shea film did yeah. back in the day like, which would be the very Carlos. well Remember, the, the Carlos two Shea films were released separately yeah well, oh, sorry it was the Carlos one Remember, oh, uh, that was the, edited together yes. and then it was the three parts I think it was yeah. released then originally, later on I mean uh, somebody was telling you that they did this, something similar with uh, was it Red Riding in the States they yes, they made a red riding movie. some TV in the UK to Which the States insane. for a cinema. Can you yeah, imagine yeah. a single red riding movie? God, how long was it? Because like, that's a tough watch. That's a tough watch, but also editing down those six yeah, hours into I, two I, seems like quite a demand. They do it with uh, The Trip as well. And the, in the US. Oh, they released them in films. cinemas. Yeah, they, they cut them down okay. from. Uh, well, they're probably but, about three hours yeah, to two, so you, right? So yeah, there's probably actually even less that with that. Well, they don't really do that. So yeah, probably would be three hours to two. All right, and then finally, and I suspect this is the scandal release of the week Greta, baby. Yes. Another uh, film we saw at uh, Vimdiff, myself and this, Jay. This should have been the surprise film, in my Certainly, opinion. In my opinion, now keep in mind, I didn't see um, I didn't see Paul Dwan's uh, What Time Is Death. We, for me... I'm glad that wasn't the surprise film, because I, yeah. I think you need to drum up a bit for that. But, yeah. but for me, was this film, was the but, Irish film of the festival, oh, and I think it was what awarded was by the very critics much the best. as well. Yeah. Uh, it's, oh, no, I, I can see that. Yeah. But, yeah, no, uh, this is great fun. Greta is this... And if you, have, if you haven't seen a trailer, please Don't avoid watch trailers. Don't trailer. Uh, if you can because the trailer gives the whole game away and it's really really annoying um, this is the story of uh, a young girl played by Chloe, Chloe Grace Moretz who on the subway in New York finds a doubled as Dub- Dublin <laughs> doubling as New York it's really bizarre uh, uh, and the cinema scene is, is filmed in the Lighthouse in Lighthouse areas. 1 yeah, yeah, they go to the cinema in Lighthouse 1 in fact they use it in the Screen Ireland ad you can see and like, use it in Urbanity as well uh, in Smithfield they, yes, they have, that was a scene Jay's moment of fame it's Urbanity <laughs> uh, but um I yeah. mean, there's a moment outside. Is it? Where is it? The is it? What's the name of that house? Oh, it's Dawson Street. Dawson it's Dawson the mansion Street, house where it's yeah, supposed to be a New York restaurant. They use the mansion house. Yeah, the like mansion house yeah. across the road. Yeah. But uh, credit is the story. She finds a bag on the subway and brings it back to the house. There's a little card that I think. Yeah. It, uh, as it's Greta who's living in this little lovely little house in the town, and she invites her in. A few things happen in the house that may or may not have <laughs> things going further down the line, and it turns into this kind of psychological thriller yeah in a kind of throwback 90s way in women a, on a, the verge and a very campy knowing oh absolutely self aware really really good fun I I said it at the time and I, I stand by it although I still suspect I wouldn't mind seeing it again I'm not sure how much of a repeat viewing fun it'll get beyond its original watch yeah. but once well, this... I was watching it I had a blast watching yeah. it oh no this, this and is I'd hardly recommend going to see it in cinema because it has some great little moments that are terrific and Hubbard's having the time of her life oh, she Again, is this, fantastic. this is Hubbard sort of fashioning this sort of like screen persona she's living inside she's bouncing the, around the yeah. place like she's having like, I mean, she's a piano teacher yeah. she's you know vaguely sinister sort of ominous yeah yeah it's got this like again you can tell it's it's Hubbard's like hey I've been embraced by like the western sort of film Canada these films that you, you remember things like uh, that came out back in the day even like things like Silence of the Lambs well, the hands or Hands Are Off the Cradle, off the cradle. Example, um, Copycat the, uh, like, yeah Copycat's yeah, perfect this whole subgenre like, of and again I was talking to uh, Stacey has been on the podcast she was talking about how she did a binge watch of all these like 90s sort of like erotic psycho- yeah, yeah. psychological thrillers Malice uh, and stuff yeah, like all that, these yeah. sort of like women on the verge of a breakdown sort yeah. of stuff and, and this is great I saw all of them in the cinema the cowboy, by the way yeah. great fun watching them and, and again <coughs> Jordan who maybe doesn't get enough credit as a director I'm a huge fan of Jordan me too I like think a, he's a very good filmmaker and like a large part of what he does is sort of like again you're talking about the company of wolves for example this yes. interest he has in fairy tales this is very much like an urban fairy tale but by way of 90s genre but, he's, but he, he, he like if anybody remembers I can't remember the name of the goddamn film you made with Robert Downey Jr. and Annette Benning, the thriller. And in Dreams. Yes. Thank you, Grace. Uh, that good is film. A, that's, it is a good film. And it, that's a touchstone for this yeah. in the context of how he 
mixes literal dreams and ideas and fairy tales and weirdness and what's real and what's not. Yeah. And he's been doing this his whole career yeah. on and off. I mean, the interview with Vampire is very schlocky in that way, very knowing in that way, and it's fantastic fun. Yeah. Um, so John... even things like the way the crying game blends genre. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. It begins as a paramilitary military thriller and then takes a very sharp left yeah. turn. It's a, like he's a he's a fascinating filmmaker. Um, and he still you always feel he's still got the goods if he can be arsed. Yeah. Uh, to do oh. so and like and he, I mean I love Byzantine. I, 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 I'm a big booster. I might Byzantine. go back to that in the way that this is kind of turning me back around on that. I wasn't a fan of it at all when I saw it, but I may give it another watch in the context of watching this because I had such a great time with this. Yeah. And I'll report back if I do. No worries. Uh, so yeah, we would have no regrets about recommending this. Oh, that had to be one, didn't there? Good God. All right. Uh, all this hobbered about nothing, eh? All this. Call stop, okay, stop. Fine, fine. All right, if people look for a bit more grace, a bit more Jane in their lives, where can they find you guys? Uh, I'm on Letterboxd at Pixie Grace. Uh, at Twitter and Jay Coyle and Letterboxd. <laughs> Am I at Twitter? Oh, whatever. At Twitter, okay. Twitter just at You know what I am. I'm at, at Twitter. Twitter, Twitter at my Twitter account is at Twitter. Yeah, it just sounded very funny. In your face. Just Jack. ask Twitter to find <laughs> Ask Twitter to find me. Like that, Jack. I got the main me. account. Uh, no, I didn't. Jay was uh, a very early Miles, investor. I am, yeah. Uh, I'm it's worth been a week, billions. <laughs> this it's, been, how, it's been a week. This is how he it's sees so many You're going to build your cinema in the woods. Oh, yeah. No one else is allowed in. Never. Follow me at Darren R. Scorbunny. I also host another podcast called The 250 with Andrew Quinn. This week, we're continuing our anime April sequence with uh, the wonderful guests of Graham Day and Marion Cassidy, our That's anime a good experts. Uh, what they'll be doing is they'll be discussing uh, the classic Akira from Akira. 1988. Tetsuo! Yeah. Kareda! Tetsuo! So Get it? I can't promise you it won't be. I saw a demo of that in the I, Darren, knowing you, I, if this is not 15 minutes, I'd be stunned. All right. Take it easy, guys. We'll be back next week. Later. Bye. Bye.